An Ascent of Kilauea by Anna Brassey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. At last we found ourselves at the very edge of the old crater, the bed of which, three or four hundred feet beneath us, was surrounded by steep and in many places overhanging sides. It looked like an enormous cauldron, four or five miles in width, full of a mass of cooled pitch. In the center was the still glowing stream of dark red lava flowing slowly toward us, and in every direction were red-hot patches and flames and smoke issuing from the ground. Yet the first sensation is rather one of disappointment, as one expects greater activity on the part of the volcano. But the new crater was still to be seen, containing the lake of fire, with steep walls rising up in the midst of the sea of lava. We spent the night at the volcano house, and at three o'clock the next afternoon, we set out, a party of eight, with two guides and three porters to carry our wraps and provisions, and to bring back specimens. First of all, we descended the precipice, three hundred feet in depth, forming the wall of the old crater, and now thickly covered with vegetation. It is so steep in many places that flights of zigzag wooden steps have been inserted in the face of the cliff in some places, in order to render the descent practicable. At the bottom we stepped straight on to the surface of the cold boil lava, which we had seen from above last night. Even here in every crevice, where a few grains of soil had collected, delicate little ferns might be seen struggling for life and thrusting out their green fronds toward the light. It was the most extraordinary walk imaginable, over that vast plain of lava, twisted and distorted into every conceivable shape and form, according to the temperature it had originally attained and the rapidity with which it had cooled, its surface like half-molten glass, cracking and breaking beneath our feet. Sometimes we came to a patch that looked like the contents of a pot, suddenly petrified in the act of boiling. Sometimes the black, iridescent lava had assumed the form of waves, or more frequently, of huge masses of rope twisted and coiled together. Sometimes it was piled up like a collection of organ pipes, or had gathered into mounds and cones of various dimensions. As we proceeded, the lava became hotter and hotter, and from every crack arose gaseous fumes, affecting our noses and throats in a painful manner, till at last when we had to pass to leeward of the molten stream flowing from the lake, the vapors almost choked us, and it was with difficulty we continued to advance. The lava was more glassy and transparent-looking, as if it had been fused at a higher temperature than usual, and the crystals of sulfur, alum, and other minerals, with which it abounded, reflected the light in bright prismatic colors. In places it was quite transparent, and we could see beneath it the long streaks of a stringy kind of lava, like brown spun glass called Pele's hair. At last we reached the foot of the present crater, and commenced the ascent of the outer wall. Many times the thin crust gave way beneath our guide, and he had to retire quickly from the hot, blinding, choking fumes that immediately burst forth. But we succeeded in reaching the top and then what a sight presented itself to our astonished eyes. I could neither speak nor move at first, but could only stand and gaze at the horrible grandeur of the scene. We were standing on the extreme edge of a precipice, overhanging a lake of molten fire a hundred feet below us, nearly a mile across. Dashing against the cliffs on the opposite side, with a noise like the roar of a stormy ocean, waves of blood-red fiery liquid lava hurled their billows upon an iron-bound headland, and then rushed up the face of the cliffs to toss their glory spray high in the air. The restless heaving lake boiled and bubbled, never remaining the same for two minutes together. Its normal color seemed to be a dull dark red, covered with a thin gray scum, which every moment and in every part swelled and cracked and emitted fountains, cascades, and whirlpools of yellow and red fire while sometimes one big golden river, sometimes four or five, flowed across it. As the sun set and darkness enveloped the scene, it became more awful than ever. We retired a little way from the brink to breathe some fresh air, and to try to eat the food we had brought with us. But this was an impossibility. Every instant a fresh explosion or glare made us jump up to survey the scene. The violent struggles of the lava to escape from its fiery bed 
and the loud and awful noises by which they were at times accompanied suggested the idea that some imprisoned monsters were trying to release themselves from their bondage with shrieks and groans and cries of agony and despair at the futility of their efforts sometimes there were at least seven spots on the borders of the lake where the molten lava dashed up furiously against the rocks seven fire fountains playing at the same time i had for some time been feeling very hot and uncomfortable and on looking round the cause was at once apparent not two inches beneath the surface the gray lava on which we were standing and sitting was red hot a stick thrust through it caught fire a piece of paper was immediately destroyed and the gentlemen found the heat from the crevices so great that they could not approach near enough to light their pipes one more long last look and then we turned our faces away from the scene that had enthralled us for so many hours the whole of the lava we had crossed in the extinct crater was now aglow in many patches and in all directions flames were bursting forth fresh lava flowing and steam and smoke were issuing from the surface it was a toilsome journey back again walking as we did in single file and obeying the strict charges of our head guide to follow him closely and to tread exactly in his footsteps on the whole it was easier by night than by day to distinguish the route to be taken as we could now see the dangers that before we could only feel and many were the fiery crevices we stepped over and jumped across once i slipped and my foot sank through the thin crust sparks issued from the ground and the stick on which i leaned it caught fire before i could fairly recover myself end of an ascent of kilauea by anna brassey Fichte and Kant on Censorship by Johann Fichte and Immanuel Kant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fichte to Kant, 22nd January, 1792 a friend whom i respect has written to me a kind and touching letter upon this subject in which he requests that in the event of a possible revision of the work during the delay which has occurred in printing i should endeavour to set two points upon which we are at issue in another light i have said that faith in a given revelation cannot reasonably be founded upon belief in miracles because no miracle is demonstrable as such but i have added in a note that it may be allowable to employ the idea of miracles having occurred in connection with a revelation in order to direct the attention of those who need the aid of outward and sensible manifestations to the other sufficient grounds upon which the revelation may be received as divine the only modification of the former principle which i can admit i have said further that a revelation cannot extend the materials of either our dogmatic or of our moral knowledge but i admit that upon transcendental objects in the fact of which existence we believe while we know nothing whatever of the mode of that existence it may furnish us with something in the room of experience something which for those who so conceive of such matters shall possess a subjective truth which however is not to be received as a substantial addition to but only an embodied and formal manifestation of those spiritual things possessed by us a priori notwithstanding continued reflection upon these points i have hitherto discovered nothing which can justify me in altering my conclusions may i venture to ask you sir as the most competent judge to tell me in two words whether any other results upon these points are to be sought for and if so in what direction or if these are the only grounds on which a critique of the revelation idea can safely proceed if you will favor me with these two words of reply i shall make no use of them inconsistent with the deep respect i entertain for you as to my friend's letter i have already said in answer that i do not cease to give my attention to the subject and shall always be ready to retract what i am convinced is erroneous 
as to the prohibition of the censor after the clearly declared object of the essay and the tone which predominates throughout its pages i can only wonder at it i cannot understand where the theological faculty acquired the right to apply their censorship to such a mode of treating such a subject kant's reply second february seventeen ninety two you desire to be informed by me whether any remedy can be found against the strict censorship upon which your book has fallen without entirely laying it aside i answer none so far as without having read the book thoroughly i can determine from what your letter announces as its leading principle namely that faith in a given revelation cannot reasonably be founded on a belief in miracles for it inevitably follows from this that a religion can contain only such articles of faith as likewise belong to the province of pure reason this principle is in my opinion quite unobjectionable and does not abolish the subjective necessity either of revelation or of miracle for it may be assumed that whether or not it might have been possible for reason unaided by revelation to have discovered those articles of faith which now when they are actually before us may indeed be comprehended by reason yet it may have been necessary to introduce them as miracles which however now when religion can support itself and its articles need no longer be relied upon as the foundation of belief but according to the maxims which seem to be adopted by the censor this principle will not carry you through for according to these certain writings must be received into the profession of faith according to their letter since it is difficult for the human understanding to comprehend them and much more for human reason to conceive of them as true and hence they really need the continued support of miracle and thus only can become articles of reasonable belief the view which represents revelation as merely a sensible manifestation of these principles in accommodation to human weakness and hence as possessed of subjective truth only is not sufficient for the censor for his views demand the recognition of its subjective truth according to the letter one way however remains open to bring your book into harmony with the idea of the censor for example if you can make him comprehend and approve the distinction between a dogmatic belief raised above all doubt and a mere moral admission resting on the insufficiency of reason to satisfy its own wants for then the faith which good moral sentiment reposes upon miracle may probably thus express itself lord i believe that is i receive it willingly although i cannot prove it sufficiently help thou mine unbelief that is i have a moral faith in respect to all i can draw from the miraculous narrative for the purposes of inward improvement and i desire to possess an historical belief in so far as that can contribute to the same end my unintentional non-belief is not confirmed unbelief but you will not easily make this distinction acceptable to a censor who it is to be feared makes historical belief an unconditional religious duty with these hastily but not inconsiderably thrown out ideas you may do whatever seems good to you provided you are yourself convinced of their truth without making any direct or indirect allusion to him who communicates them End of Fichte and Kant on Censorship by Johann Fichte and Immanuel Kant Ceylon, the Island of Jewels by Leopold Clermont This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the gem minerals with which Ceylon is so generously endowed are remarkable. 
not only for their beauty, but also on account of the great variety of them. Although the diamond, opal, emerald, and peridot are conspicuous by their absence, all the other well-known transparent gems are abundantly represented in the island. There are also many very beautiful precious stones with which the general public at all events is more or less unfamiliar. The principal mineral is corundum, of which the red and blue varieties constitute the gems ruby and sapphire. It, however, also occurs in a long series of different colors of varying shades, which range from the ruby red to delicate rose pink, from the royal sapphire to sky blue, from plum to violet and lilac, and from golden orange to primrose. There is also a most attractive rich salmon pink variety, resembling the tint of the sunrise rose, and which is known in Ceylon as patparagum, and very rarely only the mineral is found green in the island. In central Queensland, however, at a place called Anaki, the green variety is fairly plentiful, while the red and purple are entirely absent. Some of the corundum gemstones exhibit the phenomenon of asterism, that is, they display a bright, shimmering, six-pointed star with the rays divergent from the center of the stone when it is cut with a smooth, convex surface. They are found almost exclusively in Ceylon. A few ruby star stones are found in Burma. And under the name of Asterias, or star stones are highly valued by connoisseurs when of choice quality. For some unknown reason, the yellow and green varieties of corundum do not exhibit the phenomenon of asterism. Another gem mineral possesses a similar extensive range of color, except that yellow is missing, is the spinel. Some specimens of this somewhat resemble rubies and sapphires and are therefore often described as spinel rubies and spinel sapphires, respectively. It is, however, very much softer than corundum and is one of the three gemstones occurring in the form of crystals which are singly refractive, the other two being diamond and garnet. There is a remarkable flame-red variety of spinel, the color of which is unique in the whole mineral world, not even excepting the ruby. It is an exquisite gem of great value. The crystal beryl is an attractive gemstone, although its beauty is somewhat unappreciated. It occurs in shades of autumn green, brown, and yellow, and possesses great brilliancy. There are, however, two varieties of this gem mineral which form well-known and valuable precious stones. Of these, the most important is known as the alexandrite. Fine examples of this gem by daylight appear pistachio green, changing to rich mulberry red by artificial light. Ceylon is the chief source of alexandrites, although a few are found in Siberia. The other important variety of crystal beryl is the cymophane or cat's eye, which, when cut with a smooth convex face, presents a narrow white line glittering across it which has a fancied resemblance to the iris of a cat. The position of the line or ray alters as light strikes it from different angles, giving a peculiarly mysterious effect. Simophanes are only found in Ceylon. The rarest and most curious of all precious stones are those cat's eyes which change from green to red, as do the alexandrites. By the superstitious natives, the simophane is considered to be an entombed spirit, and this can be more readily understood than many other similar conceits because of the strange resemblance of the stone to the eye of an animal. Many shades of soft yellow, brown, cinnamon, and green are displayed by specimens of the mineral jargoon or zircon. This gemstone is strangely unappreciated, for not only is the coloring most pleasing, but the brilliance is second only to that of the diamond. Another reason why the neglect of the zircon is unaccountable is that this beautiful gem is comparatively inexpensive. The writer has only space briefly to complete the list of precious stones of Ceylon, for his object is to give the reader some idea of the manner in which they are handled. There are garnets, red, brown, violet, and cinnamon, topazes, white and blue, tourmalines, red, claret, green, yellow, and blue, aquamarines or beryls, sky blue and sea green, besides iolotes and moonstones. From the foregoing paragraphs, it should be apparent that these gems present a pageant of color unequaled by those of any other district. From the finding of a precious stone in a riverbed or gem pit, to its use as a jewel by a woman of fashion, it passes through many strange hands and undergoes much alteration in appearance. The securing, cutting, polishing, and marketing of such a large number of gems necessarily comprise an important industry. 
the entire trade is controlled locally by the moormen, many of whom are extremely wealthy. The foremost of them not only buy up the most important stones as they are found from time to time, but send out expeditions into the principal gem-producing areas to search for them. They all either retain their own cutters or superintend the work given out to be done. No foreigner is admitted within the magic circle of the moormen except as a customer. The moormen are descendants of the moors who once occupied Ceylon and of whose forts large ruins still exist in the island. The value of the precious stones annually exported to Europe and America from Ceylon is estimated at three million pounds, and high prices, especially for choice specimens, are realized locally from travelers and tourists. The gemstones are of igneous origin and have been loosened from the granite and gneissic rocks in which they were formed by disintegration. They are found in a stratum of alluvial gravel which is known to the natives as ilam, which is reached by digging pits of from 3 to 30 feet in depth. They are generally in the form of more or less water-worn nodules, undamaged crystals being very rare. When the pits are deep, the ilum is hoisted to the surface by means of a primitive kind of wooden crane, and it is then carried to the nearest stream or pool to be washed. It is often found in low-lying spots, and old disused gem pits which have become filled with water are available for the washing of the gem-bearing material. The ilum consists of gravel embedded in yellow or reddish clay, and is usually brought to the surface in a dry condition, but when the gem pit is below the level of a neighboring stream, it is rather muddy. Sometimes the stratum of ilum crops out, or is exposed upon the surface of the country, and this is generally found to occur on the slopes and banks of rivers and streams. When this is the case, very little excavation is done, as the material is more easily obtainable. The searching for gems is carried on from October to March. The washing is done by means of a circular, basin-shaped basket, about 28 inches in diameter and 12 in depth, which is called a gemming basket. The native, wading up to his knees, holds the basket in the water. A circular turning movement is given to the basket, which is occasionally allowed to tilt below the surface of the water, and in this way the lighter stones slip over the edge and the heavier ones remain in the basket. After a good many baskets full of gravel have been washed in this way, the residue, which is found to contain thorianite and thorite and other heavy minerals, is carefully searched for gemstones. The number of gems found of insignificant value is extremely large in proportion to that of the choice specimens, so that often a great deal of work is done before there is any prospect of recompense. When an important stone is discovered, there is great excitement among the natives, and many would-be buyers eagerly endeavor to outdo each other in obtaining a bargain. The price asked is generally several times greater than that which is eventually accepted, and by continual bartering the gem changes hands repeatedly. Also, there are ever-ready pilfering fingers to purloin from the rightful owner or to substitute an inferior stone for one of good quality. The diggers and washers are continually watched to prevent anything of the kind from taking place. It is a matter of great difficulty for Europeans to obtain details or photographs of the gemming industry, for the natives are very jealous and secretive, and object to company upon their expeditions. They are also exceedingly superstitious, and believe in all sorts of devils and evil omens. They will not even allow one of their own women to go near a gem pit, because she would be sure to bring bad luck to it. There are several extensive districts in the island where precious stones occur, but the most productive locality is the hilly country of Safragan, the chief town of which is Ratnampura, or in other words, the city of rubies. Nearly all the different kinds of gems are found occurring together, the exceptions being moonstones, amethysts, and alexandrites, the last of which are principally derived from Gaul. The natives have a great prejudice against sending gems out of the island in the rough state, and always cut and polish them locally. This is due to their anxiety to see exactly to what extent the beauty of each stone is developed by the cutting and thus accurately to estimate the value. They do not care to part with the rough stones for Europeans to reap the benefit of any increase in value. The cutting and polishing is done by the Singalese upon perpendicular leaden wheels smeared with emery against one side of which the gem is pressed with the left hand while the wheel is rotated by means of a bow and cord held in the right. The whole apparatus is most simple and primitive. 
the success of the work depending entirely upon the skill of the operator. The cutters squat upon their haunches behind the wheels, and sometimes an overseer watches the progress of work to prevent theft. Much of the cutting is done by the roadside in view of every passerby, but many little tricks of the trade are withheld from public view. The native gem cutter's chief object is to so manipulate the precious stone that the maximum of size and weight is retained, often to the sacrifice of symmetry and brilliancy. They are wonderfully adept at retaining and regulating the color, which in some gemstones is not of uniform density throughout, and in dexterously hiding feathers and flaws. Owing, however, to irregularity, and also to the want of symmetry and proper proportion, it is generally found that the gemstones in the native cut condition are unsuitable for the requirements of high-class European jewelry. It is therefore necessary, before they can be used for the purpose, that they shall be recut by a skilled lapidary with a knowledge of mineralogy and optics. In principle, the apparatus used by the European gem cutter is similar to that used by the Moor in Ceylon. The wheel is, however, made of copper and diamond dust and revolves horizontally instead of perpendicularly. The operator sits at a bench and places the gem, mounted on a small ebony holder, against the surface of the wheel, which he rotates by means of a crank held in the left hand. Although the apparatus is simple, much expert knowledge, skill, and experience are requisite for success in this delicate and artistic craft. End of Ceylon, the Island of Jewels by Leopold Claremont Cochineal from Insects and Man, an account of the more important, harmful, and beneficial insects, their habits and life histories, 1915, by C. A. Eland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cochineal Insect, Dactylopius coccus is another member of the family Coccidae, deserving a place among the useful insects. Without exaggeration, it may justly be called the most celebrated of all the scale insects. Cochineal in the larval and female adult forms is essentially parasitic upon the prickly pear, Opuntia coccinellifera, though it lives equally well on some other allied species. The adult male is very minute, only a millimeter in length, and of a carmine color, which is intensified on its head and thorax. The wings, which are longer than the body, have only a single bifurcated yellowish-brown vein, and the head is provided with four compound and two simple eyes, whilst from the last segment of the abdomen two long bristles arise. The female is about six times larger than the male, measuring from six to seven millimeters in length, deep red-brown in color, and segmented, though the segments are hidden by a white, waxy secretion. The life history of this insect is so similar to that of our other examples from the same family, the lac insect and the San Jose scale, that there is no need for reiteration. The winged male dies after mating. The resting female deposits her offspring, according to some authorities, viviparously, according to others, as eggs. But whichever is the method, the larvae are covered by the waxy secretion of their mother, in which, though very active, they remain for about nine days. At first, they closely resemble their mother, who, by the way, dies after oviposition. But even at this stage, the sexes can be distinguished, for the antennae of the males are composed of five segments, while those of the females have six. In a fortnight, after several molts, the larvae are full grown. The male, during growth, surrounds itself with a waxy covering from which it emerges in the winged adult form after the last molt. But the female remains on the spot where she first plunged her larval rostrum into the tissues of the prickly pear. 
the commercial history of this insect is perhaps of greater interest than its life history a native of mexico it was known and utilized by the aztecs before america was discovered by europeans lopez de gomara in 1525 first described cochineal but he took it to be a seed and it was not until the time of plumier in 1666 that its true insect nature was guessed even then however many scientists of that and later times persisted in believing the seed theory so in 1729 melchior de rucher published certain documents he had received from mexico which once and for all settled the question when the spaniards conquered mexico they recognized that the cochineal industry would be a source of wealth and they at once tried to establish a monopoly punishing with death anyone detected attempting to take the female insects out of the country this monopoly was strictly upheld and as long as mexico remained a spanish colony cochineal could be obtained through spain and spain alone that the industry was no mean one may be gathered from a statement in de lambert and diderot's encyclopedia in which they say that eight hundred thousand pounds of cochineal of the value of fifteen million five hundred thousand six hundred and ninety francs reached europe in seventeen thirty four and in seventeen sixty the insect to the value of four million francs reached marseilles alone and de humboldt relates that at the time of his voyage to america the annual export of this commodity exceeded twelve million francs de rucher gives some interesting details of the cultivation of cochineal by the mexicans at the beginning of the eighteenth century during the winter the insects were kept indoors as a protection from inclement weather but when the warm weather arrived as soon as they were old enough to reproduce their kind they were placed twelve together in little nests made by the natives out of hay straw moss or best of all from the most tender fibers of the coconut the nests and their contents were then affixed to the prickly pears and in due course the larvae emerged from the nests sought out the greenest and youngest parts of the plants and collected for the most part on the sides sheltered from the prevailing winds during their growth they were most carefully tended and protected from their enemies even spiders webs being cleaned from the prickly pears lest the precious insects should be harmed moreover the wild cochineal insects which also flourished on the same plants were considered so objectionable that they were not allowed to mingle with their pampered relatives there were three harvests a year and at the last one branches laden with the cochineal parasites were cut and taken indoors so that they might be protected during the rainy season the usual method of killing the insects was either by pouring boiling water over them or by roasting them in specially constructed ovens at times however they were roasted on the frying pans which the native women used for baking their bread and in drying the insects lost one-third of their weight these cultural methods have changed but little with the march of time Raymour, the celebrated french scientist in his writings predicted that the time would come when cochineal would be smuggled out of mexico in the same manner that the silkworm had reached europe from china forty years later theory de menonville inspired by what Raymour had written traveled to mexico secured some of the coveted insects and took them to port au prince a native insurrection however put an end to the venture which was never repeated in 1806 the insect made its first appearance in europe where its food plant had long been known 
at Cadiz, Toulon, in the south of Spain, and in Italy, unsuccessful attempts were made to acclimatize it. In 1810, owing to an insurrection, Mexico was lost to Spain, and 17 years later, further attempts were made to establish the insect in Corsica, Sardinia, and in the neighborhood of Granada and Valencia. As before, the attempt resulted in failure, for the climate of Europe was evidently ill-suited to so delicate an insect. In the same year, however, cochineal was introduced into the Canary Islands, and a veritable godsend it proved to the islanders. The director of the botanic gardens at Orotava, Bertholo by name, received some living specimens from Cadiz and placed them on the prickly pears in his gardens. So well did the insects thrive that by the end of the year he proposed to distribute them over the island to all who had the necessary food plants on their land. His project was received with scant courtesy and almost opposition, so that it also came to naught. Almost at the same time, the Spanish government established a cochineal farm at Santa Cruz, and despite the fact that those in charge displayed unwanted energy in the matter, sent the insects to the neighboring islands, and used every means to interest the peasant proprietors in the scheme, in less than two years all trace of the industry had vanished. Not so, however, the insects themselves. In the neighborhood of Orotava, when left to themselves, they increased rapidly, so much so that in 1833, after an island life of only five years, they threatened to totally destroy the prickly pears which the poorer inhabitants used as food. Measures for the extermination of the insects were set on foot but before they had been put into execution, some of the islanders, more far-seeing than their neighbors, took up the cultivation of the prickly pear, and incidentally of cochineal, with the result that the once despised insect became the greatest source of wealth that the Canary Islands have ever known. From an export of eight and a half pounds of cochineal in 1831, the island industry increased by leaps and bounds to a total export of 842,827 pounds in 1850. When we take into consideration that one pound of dried cochineal represents about 70,000 insects, the insect mortality in these favorable years was beyond computation. During part of this time, the vines in the Canary Islands were almost totally destroyed by a fungoid disease, and cochineal, in very truth, saved the islanders from starvation. In the Canary Islands, the insects are cultivated mainly on cactus tuna and a dwarf species. The former, a large leafed species, is utilized in Tenerife and on the eastern islands. The latter, smaller-leaved species, finds favor in Las Palmas and the other islands. In the early days of the industry, women were employed to collect the insects from the plants in metal spoons, a slow method that entailed much waste. Now, however, a quicker method is used. The branches are gathered and then beaten with small brooms made of palm leaves in order to detach the insects. This rough pruning causes the plants to send out the fresh young growth, which is so essential for the cochineal. In order to make certain that the young insects shall be well looked after in early life, the fertilized females, recognized by a reddish posterior spot, are carefully collected, covered with a linen cloth, and subjected to a temperature of about 20 degrees centigrade. This proceeding hastens the advent of the larvae, which on their first appearance show great activity, but eventually settle down on the surrounding linen. 
the fragments of linen are then carried by night and fastened to the prickly pears and without delay the larval insects affix themselves to the plant and begin feeding the linen however is left on the plant for some time to give shade to the larvae and to keep them dry in three months the cochineal insects are fully developed and harvest time is at hand women do the work some breaking off the branches others brushing them in order to remove the insects which are then spread in thin layers and dried in the sun or subjected to a temperature of about 40 degrees centigrade after drying the insects are cleaned from portions of their food plants and other impurities and then are put on the market as plateada or as madres the former which are the majority and therefore cheaper are the young unmated females the latter are females which have produced young at the present day the cochineal insect is cultivated mainly in honduras and the canary islands and though the industry has languished considerably since the discovery of aniline dyes its fall is as nothing compared to the fall in price of the commodity which at the present day is less than a fifth of what it was in the heyday of the industry of the uses of cochineal we have spoken in another chapter but the least sentimental of us must regret that a beautiful red dye once universally used and around which hangs such an atmosphere of romance is now mainly of service in the decoration of fancy cakes and of cochineal from insects and man an account of the more important harmful and beneficial insects their habits and life histories 1915 by c a eland read for librivox by sue anderson the contented man by g k chesterton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the word content is not inspiring nowadays rather it is irritating because it is dull it prepares the mind for a little sermon in the style of the vicar of wakefield about how you and i should be satisfied with our countrified innocence and our simple village sports the word however has two meanings somewhat singularly connected the sweet content of the poet and the cubic content of the mathematician some distinguish these by stressing the different syllables thus it might happen to any of us at some social juncture to remark a gaily of the content of the king of the cannibal islands stew-pot i am content to be ignorant or not content with measuring the cubic content of my safe you are stealing the spoons and there really is an analogy between the mathematical and the moral use of the term for the lack of the observation of which the latter has been much weakened and misused the preaching of contentment is in disrepute well deserved in so far that the moral is really quite inapplicable to the anarchy and insane peril of our tall and toppling cities content suggests some kind of security and it is not strange that our workers should often think about rising above their position since they have so continually to think about sinking below it the philanthropist who urges the poor to saving and simple pleasures deserves all the derision that he gets to advise people to be content with what they have got may or may not be sound moral philosophy but to urge people to be content with what they haven't got is a piece of impudence hard for even the english poor to pardon but though the creed of content is unsuited to certain special riddles and wrongs it remains true for the normal of mortal life we speak of divine discontent discontent may sometimes be a divine thing but content must always be the human thing 
it may be true that a particular man in his relation to his master or his neighbour to his country or his enemies will do well to be fiercely unsatisfied or thirsting for an angry justice but it is not true no sane person can call it true that man as a whole in his general attitude towards the world in his posture towards death or green fields towards the weather or the baby will be wise to cultivate dissatisfaction in a broad estimate of our earthly experience the great truism on the tablet remains he must not covet his neighbor's ox nor his ass nor anything that is his in highly complex and scientific civilizations he may sometimes find himself forced into an exceptional vigilance but then in highly complex and scientific civilizations nine times out of ten he only wants his own ass back but i wish to urge the case for cubic content in which even more than in moral content i take a personal interest now moral content has been undervalued and neglected because of its separation from the other meaning it has become a negative rather than a positive thing in some accounts of contentment it seems to be little more than a meek despair but this is not the true meaning of the term it should stand for the idea of a positive and thorough appreciation of the content of anything for feeling the substance and not merely the surface of experience content ought to mean in english as it does in french being pleased placidly perhaps but still positively pleased being contented with bread and cheese ought not to mean not caring what you eat it ought to mean caring for bread and cheese handling and enjoying the cubic content of the bread and cheese and adding it to your own being content with an attic ought not to mean being unable to move from it and resigned to living in it it ought to mean appreciating what there is to appreciate in such a position such as the quaint and elvish slope of the ceiling or the sublime aerial view of the opposite chimney pots and in this sense contentment is a real and even an active virtue it is not only affirmative but creative the poet in the attic does not forget the attic in poetic musings he remembers whatever the attic has of poetry he realizes how high how starry how cool how unadorned and simple in short how attic is the attic true contentment is a thing as active as agriculture it is the power of getting out of any situation all there is in it it is arduous and it is rare the absence of this digestive talent is what makes so cold and incredible the tales of so many people who say they have been through things when it is evident that they have come out on the other side quite unchanged a man might have gone through a plum pudding as a bullet might go through a plum pudding it depends on the size of the pudding and the man but the awful and sacred question is has the pudding been through him has he tasted appreciated and absorbed the solid pudding with its three dimensions and its three thousand tastes and smells can he offer himself to the eyes of men as one who has cubically conquered and contained a pudding in the same way we may ask of those who profess to have passed through trivial or tragic experiences whether they have absorbed the content of them whether they licked up such living water as there was it is a pertinent question in connection with many modern problems thus the young genius says i have lived in my dreary and squalid village before i found success in paris or vienna the sound philosopher will answer you have never lived in your village or you would not call it dreary and squalid thus the imperialist the colonial idealist who commonly speaks and always thinks with a yankee accent will say i've been right away from these little muddy islands and seen god's great seas and prairies the sound philosopher will reply you have never been in these islands 
you have never seen the weald of sussex or the plain of salisbury otherwise you could never have called them either muddy or little thus the suffragette will say i have passed through the paltry duties of pots and pans the drudgery of the vulgar kitchen but i have come out to intellectual liberty the sound philosopher will answer you have never passed through the kitchen or you never would call it vulgar wiser and stronger women than you have really seen poetry in pots and pans naturally because there is a poetry in them it is right for the village violinist to climb into fame in paris or vienna it is right for the stray englishman to climb across the high shoulder of the world it is right for the woman to climb into whatever cathedra or high places she can allow to her sexual dignity but it is wrong that any of these climbers should kick the ladder by which they have climbed but indeed these bitter people who record their experiences really record their lack of experiences it is the countryman who has not succeeded in being a countryman who comes up to london it is the clerk who has not succeeded in being a clerk who tries on vegetarian principles to be a countryman and the woman with a past is generally a woman angry about the past she never had when you have really exhausted an experience you always reverence and love it the two things that nearly all of us have thoroughly and really been through are childhood and youth and though we would not have them back again on any account we feel that they are both beautiful because we have drunk them dry end of the contented man by g k chesterton read by phil schempf the ecological toad from the frog book north american toads and frogs by mary c dickerson 1906 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. At the close of a hot summer's day, we sit on the doorstep of a country house, delighting in the coolness and repose, and watching the lengthening shadows of grape trellis, well curb, and house. A fat toad comes out from under the doorstep, where he has been quietly sleeping all day. Another, clean and bright eyed, comes from under the sidewalk at our feet. They start off with leisurely hops toward the garden to search for caterpillars and other delicious morsels of a toad's menu. We watch their retreating backs until they disappear among rows of beets and lettuce, and we wish them good hunting. Night after night, summer after summer, toads come out in search of food. They become a part of the place. They help make the home and contribute their share in its work. Toads choose cool, moist places in which to live. They are often found in cellars, under porches and sidewalks, and in various dark or damp hiding places. They seek such locations not only for the shelter, but also for the moisture. A toad never has the pleasure of drinking water in the usual way all the water that he gets is absorbed through his skin a toad kept in a dry place grows thinner and more distressed looking and is likely to die within a few days whereas one provided with plenty of moisture remains plump and contented as the weeks go by even when there is a scarcity of food it would however be a great mistake to think that a toad does not take pleasure in drinking. He sprawls out in shallow water or on a wet surface and has a contented expression in his wonderful eyes as he literally soaks in the water. In the country in midsummer, when pools and springs are dry, toads very often travel long distances to spend the night on the wet ground around a well of some sort. In their search for moisture, they sometimes unwittingly fall into wells to lead a most somber existence, 
feeding upon the few low forms of life that live there and upon unfortunates who become prisoners in the same way that they themselves did release may come if the well has a bucket but more likely their fate is a tragic one their crushed bodies have been taken from pumps into which they have been sucked they have sometimes been found hibernating in old wells where they must have been for ten or fifteen years judging by the amount of debris under which they are buried we always have been and still are somewhat prejudiced against the coldness of the toad he is less fortunate than we are in being wholly instead of only partially dependent on the sun for his warmth on a warm day his temperature may be very high and on a cold day he is very cold indeed so cold that he may snuggle deeper into his bed and sleep all day our epithet slimy he does not deserve at all in fact he is quite dry and comfortable to the touch at least he is so when we first take him up a moment later if we seized him too quickly and vigorously he may be somewhat wet for among his protective habits is the one of pouring out a colorless odorless fluid upon the enemy but even with this he is quite harmless in addition to this fluid the toad has another which is slightly poisonous and which is secreted by the skin this secretion is especially abundant in the paratoid glands the two large swellings behind the eyes when the toad is in very great agony as for example when he is seized by the teeth of an enemy he pours out this fluid in sufficient quantity to cause it to appear in milky drops on the gland like swellings this fluid has a disagreeable effect on the mucous membrane of the mouth and so protects the toad from many enemies watch the dog's behavior towards toads that have taken up residence in the garden or about the house he either gives them a wide berth or simply teases them being careful not to take them into his mouth a young dog may bite a toad but the experience is likely to prove so disagreeable that he does not repeat it the irritating secretion is not poured out at all unless the toad is in severe pain this fluid can do no injury to man unless it gets into the mouth or eyes the toad has been greatly maligned by stories of its poisonous effects on man and man's belongings instead of bringing ill luck the gentle fellow is one of our great blessings the toad has come to our gardens and to the very doors of our houses because he can get an abundance of food there also because as one of man's domestic animals he escapes some of his natural enemies as for man he may well look upon the toad at his door as a good fairy somewhat in disguise we must admit in fact we might let the toad remain wrapped in the veil of magic that the superstition of past ages put upon him but change the import of the magic to good instead of evil that the toad is the gardener's ally has been proved beyond a doubt the economic value of the toad has been recognized in this country as well as in others for many years gardeners in france have been glad to buy toads in order to have them as insect destroyers the toad remains quietly sleeping through the greater part of the day thereby keeping himself from being a nuisance and also saving himself from the danger of being stepped upon but at sunset or often earlier than that he comes out from his bed under porch or shrubbery and starts on his regular tour over lawns and through gardens the hunt is an exciting one for the toad eats living moving food only he must lie low approach cautiously but rapidly move most alertly at the final moment and perhaps meet with disappointment after all 
as the grasshopper takes wing or the caterpillar rolls into a motionless ball. Then there is always the possibility of a lurking enemy. It may be a snake that lives under the woodpile and is out on his afternoon hunt, or an owl that nests in the hollow oak and in the dusk approaches so silently that the first intimation of her nearness is the clutch of sharp claws. Or a skunk may roll the toad under his paw, preliminary to swallowing it. The chase must always be an eager one, because the toad is always hungry. His gastronomic ability is so great that he must have four meals per day, or rather his stomach must be filled and emptied four times in each 24 hours. He must therefore hunt and eat almost incessantly in order to get as much as he needs. The tongue of the toad with which he catches his food is admirably adapted to its work. It has a sticky surface from which escape of the prey is impossible, and it is fastened at the front instead of at the back. The latter fact makes it possible for the toad to throw the tongue well out of the mouth. The toad eats almost all kinds of small living things that are out in the late afternoon and at night. He may sit for an hour or more on the back step and catch the flies and mosquitoes that come to the screen door in their attempt to get into the house. He sits with head bent forward and eyes looking very bright and intelligent. When he sees a fly alight within two inches of his nose, he makes no perceptible movement of the head or body. The mouth opens and the fly is gone. When the fly alights further away, the toad springs forward on his strong hind legs, then easily slips back into a sitting posture again. That is all that we can see, but again the fly is gone. Look once more. There are many chances to observe, for he is bobbing back and forth as fast as possible, and the flies are constantly disappearing. The free hind end of the tongue is thrown out and pulled back so quickly that we can scarcely see the flash of pink. The tongue touches the fly, however, which adheres to its sticky surface and so is carried far into the back of the mouth. The toad walks over the lawn and catches the crickets, the locusts, and the grasshoppers there, not in the least objecting to their hard coats, their long spiny legs, and the molasses of the locusts. He may swallow even a bee or a wasp found on the low clovers or dandelions, and seems to feel much less uncomfortable afterward than one might suppose. Further out in the garden, he snaps up the beetles and bugs that are running close to the ground or eating the potato, squash, or cucumber leaves. He rejoices as a blundering may beetle noisily sheaths its wings near him. Before it has time to begin the task of laying its many eggs, it furnishes a mouthful that makes the toad shut his eyes hard several times to get the big thing swallowed. For, strange as it may seem, the large eyes of the toad can be pressed down into the mouth as far below its roof as they rise above the head, and the movement aids effectually in swallowing. If the farmer could see, he would surely smile with satisfaction, for this may beetle is the mother of the white grubs that feed on roots and underground stems, and so ruin his pasture and spoil his potato crop. It is not beneath the dignity of the toad to sit and feast on the plant lice that live on the lettuce. He swallows any spiders he may catch. He may sit in one place for a long time and eat the ants that are about an ant hill or that gather on a decaying apple or pear. He loiters about the roots of the corn and attacks the cutworms as they come out from their day hiding places and start to climb to the leaves they devour at night. The dusk changes to night, but as long as there is any light, the toad can see. 
His eyes are large and placed on the very top of his head. The golden iris contracts more and more. The pupil becomes correspondingly larger until the eye seems a great black hole in the toad's head. He can see nothing when it is totally dark, but there is usually enough light to see moving objects. He can see the tent caterpillars that have left their silken homes on the apple or cherry tree and are hurrying over the ground to find sheltered spots in which to build cocoons. He can see the caterpillar of the morning cloak butterfly on a similar search and swallows it, spiny coat and all. He has no difficulty in spying out the white-marked tussock caterpillars that are changing their feeding grounds from rosebush to snowball or honeysuckle. He does not seem to mind in the least if a caterpillar is thickly set with hairs. In fact, small one-year-old toads will seize and greedily eat the common hairy caterpillars. Click beetles that have been in hiding all day are often captured. This would surely rejoice the heart of the farmer if only he could see, for the young of these are the much-fought wireworms that damage the growing vegetables and grains. The following statistics are valuable not only in that they introduce us to the real worth of the toad, but also because they are accurate, being the results of scientific investigation of the matter. It is found that 88% of a toad's food consists of insects and other small creatures that are considered pests in the garden, grain field, or pasture. It is estimated that in three months a toad will eat 9,936 injurious insects, and that of this number, 1,988, 16% of all its food are cutworms. Counting the cutworms only, the estimated value of a single toad is $19.88 per year if the injury done by a single cutworm be put at the low figure of one cent per year. During the pest of army worms, one toad examined was found to have eaten 55 of the caterpillars. During the siege with gypsy moths, there were found 65 larvae in the stomach of one toad. Another toad which was examined was found to have eaten 37 full-grown tent caterpillars. The farmer and the market gardener, in the light of these statistics, and face to face with their almost endless struggles against insect pests, are beginning to value toads. They have shown their recognition of the value of toads by asking for legislation to protect them, similar to that which protects birds end of the ecological toad from the frog book north american toads and frogs by mary c dickerson 1906 read for librivox by sue anderson an essay concerning humane understanding volume two by john locke 1632 to 1704 excerpt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org book 3 of words chapter 1 of words or language in general 1 man fitted to form articulate sounds god having designed man for a sociable creature made him not only with an inclination and under a necessity to have fellowship with those of his own kind but furnished him also with language which was to be the great instrument and common tie of society man therefore had by nature his organs so fashioned as to be fit to frame articulate sounds which we call words but this was not enough to produce language for parrots and several other birds will be taught to make articulate sounds distinct enough which yet by no means are capable of language two to use the sound as signs of ideas 
besides articulate sounds therefore it was further necessary that he should be able to use these sounds as signs of internal conceptions and to make them stand as marks for the ideas within his own mind whereby they might be made known to others and the thoughts of men's minds be conveyed from one to another three to make them general signs but neither was this sufficient to make words so useful as they ought to be it is not enough for the perfection of language that sounds can be made signs of ideas unless those signs can be so made use of as to comprehend several particular things for the multiplication of words would have perplexed their use had every particular thing need a distinct name to be signified by to remedy this inconvenience language had yet a further improvement in the use of general terms whereby one word was made to mark a multitude of particular existences which advantageous use of sounds was obtained only by the difference of the ideas they were made signs of those names becoming general which are made to stand for general ideas and those remaining particular where the ideas they are used for are particular four to make them signify the absence of positive ideas besides these names which stand for ideas there be other words which men make use of not to signify any idea but the want or absence of some ideas simple or complex or all ideas together such as nihil in latin and in english ignorance and barrenness all which negative or privative words cannot be said properly to belong to or signify no ideas for then they would be perfectly insignificant sounds but they relate to positive ideas and signify their absence five words ultimately derived from such as signify sensible ideas it may also lead us a little towards the original of all our notions and knowledge if we remark how great a dependence our words have on common sensible ideas and how those which are made use of to stand for actions and notions quite removed from sense have their rise from thence and from obvious sensible ideas are transferred to more abstruse significations and made to stand for ideas that come not under the cognizance of our senses namely to imagine apprehend comprehend adhere conceive instill disgust disturbance tranquillity etc are all words taken from the operations of sensible things and applied to certain modes of thinking spirit in its primary signification is breath angel a messenger and i doubt not but if we could trace them to their sources we should find in all languages the names which stand for things that fall not under our senses to have had their first rise from sensible ideas by which we may give some kind of guess what kind of notions they were and whence derived which filled their minds who were the first beginners of language and how nature even in the naming of things unawares suggested to men the originals and principles of all their knowledge whilst to give names that might make known to others any operations they felt in themselves or any other ideas that came not under their senses they were fain to borrow words from ordinary known ideas of sensation by that means to make others the more easily to conceive those operations they experimented in themselves which made no outward sensible appearances and then when they had got known and agreed names to signify those internal operations of their minds they were sufficiently furnished to make known by words all their other ideas since they could consist of nothing but either of outward sensible perceptions or of the inward operations of their minds about them we have as has been proved no ideas at all but what originally came either from sensible objects without or what we feel within ourselves from the inward working of our own spirits of which we are conscious of ourselves within 
6. Distribution of subjects to be treated of. But to understand better the use and force of language, as subservient to instruction and knowledge, it will be convenient to consider, first, to what it is that names in the use of language are immediately applied. Secondly, since all, except proper names, are general, and so stand not particularly for this or that single thing, but for sorts and ranks of things, it will be necessary to consider in the next place what the sorts and kinds, or if you would rather say the Latin names, what the species and genera of things are, wherein they consist, and how they come to be made. These being, as they ought, well looked into, we shall the better come to find the right use of words, the natural advantages and defects of language, and the remedies that ought to be used to avoid the inconveniences of obscurity or uncertainty in the signification of words without which it is impossible to discourse with any clearness or order concerning knowledge which being conversant about propositions and those most commonly universal ones has greater connection with words than perhaps is suspected these considerations, therefore, shall be the matter of the following chapters. Chapter 2 of the Signification of Words 1. Words are sensible signs necessary for communication of ideas. Man, though he have great variety of thoughts, and such from which others as well as himself might receive profit and delight, yet they are all within their own breast, invisible and hidden from others nor can of themselves be made to appear the comfort and advantage of society not being to be had without communication of thoughts it was necessary that man should find out some external sensible signs whereof of those invisible ideas which his thoughts are made up of might be made known to others for this purpose nothing was so fit either for plenty or quickness as those articulate sounds which with so much ease and variety he found himself able to make thus we may conceive how words which were by nature so well adapted to that purpose came to be made use of by men as the signs of their ideas not by any natural connection that there is between particular articulate sounds and certain ideas for then there would be but one language amongst all men but by a voluntary imposition whereby such a word is made arbitrarily the mark of such an idea the use then of words is to be sensible marks of ideas and the ideas they stand for are their proper and immediate signification two words in their immediate signification are the sensible signs of his ideas who uses them the use men have of these marks being either to record their own thoughts for the assistance of their own memory or as it were to bring out their ideas and lay them before the view of others words in their primary or immediate signification stand for nothing but the ideas in the mind of him that uses them how imperfectly soever or carelessly those ideas are collected from the things which they are supposed to represent when a man speaks to another it is that he may be understood and the end of speech is that those sounds as marks may make known his ideas to the hearer that then which words are the marks of are the ideas of the speaker nor can any one apply them as marks immediately to anything else but the ideas that he himself hath for this would be to make them signs of his own conceptions and yet apply them to other ideas which would be to make them signs and not signs of his ideas at the same time and so in effect to have no signification at all words being voluntary signs they cannot be voluntary signs imposed by him on things he knows not that would be to make them signs of nothing sounds without signification a man cannot make his words the signs either of qualities in things or of conceptions in the mind of another whereof he hath none of his own 
till he has some ideas of his own he cannot suppose them to correspond with the conceptions of another man nor can he use any signs for them for thus they would be the signs of he knows not what which is in truth to be the signs of nothing but when he represents to himself other men's ideas by some of his own if he consent to give them the same names that other men do it is still to his own ideas to ideas that he has and not to ideas that he has not three examples of this this is so necessary in the use of language that in this respect the knowing and the ignorant the learned and the unlearned use the words they speak with any meaning all alike they in every man's mouth stand for the ideas he has and which he would express by them a child having taken notice of nothing in the metal he hears called gold but the bright shiny yellow colour he applies the word gold only to his own ideas of that colour and nothing else and therefore calls the same colour in a peacock's tail gold another that hath better observed adds to shining yellow great weight and then the sound gold when he uses it stands for a complex idea of a shining yellow and a very weighty substance another adds to those qualities fusibility and then the word gold signifies to him a body bright yellow fusible and very heavy another adds malleability each of these uses equally the word gold when they have occasion to express the idea which they have applied to it but it is evident that each can apply it only to his own idea nor can he make it stand as a sign of such a complex idea as he has not four words are often secretly referred first to the ideas supposed to be in other men's minds but though words as they are used by men can properly and immediately signify nothing but the ideas that are in the mind of the speaker yet they in their thoughts give them a secret reference to two other things first they suppose their words to be marks of the ideas in the minds also of other men with whom they communicate for else they should talk in vain and could not be understood if the sounds they applied to one idea were such as by the hearer were applied to another which is to speak two languages but in this men stand not usually to examine whether the idea they and those they discourse with have in their minds be the same but think it enough that they use a word as they imagine in the common acceptation of that language in which they suppose that the idea they make it a sign of is precisely the same to which the understanding men of that country apply that name five secondly to the reality of things secondly because men would not be thought to talk barely of their own imagination but of things as really they are therefore they often suppose the words to stand also for the reality of things but this relating more particularly to substance and their names as perhaps the former does to simple ideas and modes we shall speak of these two different ways of applying words more at large when we have come to treat of the names of mixed modes and substances in particular though give me leave here to say that it is a perverting the use of words and brings unavoidable obscurity and confusion into their signification whenever we make them stand for anything but those ideas we have in our own minds six words by use readily excite ideas of their objects concerning words also it is further to be considered first that they being immediately the signs of men's ideas and by that means the instruments whereby men communicate their conceptions and express to one another those thoughts and imaginations they have within their own breasts there comes by constant use to be such a connection between certain sounds and the ideas they stand for 
that the names heard almost as readily excite certain ideas as if the objects themselves which are apt to produce them did actually affect the senses which is manifestly so in all obvious sensible qualities and in all substances that frequently and familiarly occur to us seven words are often used without signification and why secondly that though the proper and immediate signification of words are ideas in the mind of the speaker yet by familiar use of our cradles we come to learn certain articulate sounds very perfectly and have them readily on our tongue and always at hand in our memories and yet are not always careful to examine or settle their significations perfectly it often happens that men even when they would apply themselves to an attentive consideration do set their thoughts more on words than things nay because words are many of them learned before the ideas are known for which they stand therefore some not only children but men speak several words no otherwise than parrots do only because they have learned them and have been accustomed to those sounds but so far as words are of use and signification so far is there a constant connection between the sound and the idea and a designation that the one stands for the other without which application of them they are nothing but so much insignificant noise eight their signification perfectly arbitrary not the consequence of a natural connection words by long and familiar use as has been said come to excite in men certain ideas so constantly and readily that they are apt to suppose a natural connection between them but that they signify only men's peculiar ideas and that by a perfect arbitrary imposition is evident in that they often fail to incite in others even that use the same language the same ideas we take them to be signs of and every man has so inviolable a liberty to make words stand for what ideas he pleases that no one hath the power to make others have the same ideas in their minds that he has when they use the same words that he does and therefore the great augustus himself in the possession of that power which ruled the world acknowledged he could not make a new latin word which was as much as to say that he could not arbitrarily appoint what idea any sound should be a sign of in the mouths and common language of his subjects it is true common use by a tacit consent appropriate certain sounds to certain ideas in all languages which so far limits the signification of that sound that unless a man applies it to the same idea he does not speak properly and let me add that unless a man's words excite the same ideas in the hearer which he makes them stand for in speaking he does not speak intelligently but whatever be the consequence of any man's using words differently either from their general meaning or the particular sense of the person to whom he addresses them this is certain their signification in his use of them is limited to his ideas and they can be signs of nothing else end of an essay concerning humane understanding volume two excerpt by john locke sixteen thirty two to seventeen o four the four minute men of chicago by the history committee of the four minute men of chicago this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. now that this work has come to its conclusion and the name of the four minute men has become a part of the history of the great war i would not willingly omit my heartfelt testimony to its great value to the country and indeed to civilization as a whole during our period of national trial and triumph from president wilson's farewell letter to the four minute men of america 
the Four Minute Men. The Four Minute Men were a nationwide organization of public speakers under government control during the period of America's participation in the World War. Although the idea and early plans for the Four Minute Men originated in Chicago in the early part of April 1917, the work officially became a division of the Committee on Public Information on June 16, 1917, when the national headquarters were removed to Washington. The national organization and all its branches ended official existence on December 24, 1918. Between these dates, the four Minute Men of America, numbering about 75,000 speakers throughout 37 speaking campaigns, delivered over 750,000 speeches to audiences totaling 315 million persons. The speeches were delivered almost exclusively in the motion picture theaters of the country during four-minute intermissions. The work was organized in 7,448 cities and towns, including every state in the Union. The part of the work done by the four-minute men of Chicago is the subject and scope of the following pages. The Four-Minute Men of Chicago to Chicago belongs the honor of originating the plan for the nationwide organization of public speakers known as the Four Minute Men. To Chicago also fell the task of working out many of the details of local organization, which afterwards became a part of the standard plan for other centers throughout the country. This history of the Chicago branch of the Four Minute Men is written in part as a souvenir for those who were privileged to take part in the work and in part as a permanent record of a typical unit of a great national organization that attained for itself a place in the history of the United States and its part in the Great War. 1. Early Days The first period of the history of the Four Minute Men extends from the inception of the idea in Chicago until the establishment of national headquarters in Washington. To Donald Ryerson, of Chicago, belongs the undisputed title of originator of the Four Minute Men. He was the first to see the tremendous possibilities of a national organization of public speakers for patriotic service, the first to make an experimental four-minute speech in a motion picture theater, and the first to assume the burden of establishing such an organization as an instrument of the government for wartime service. Although the formal declaration of a state of war with Germany was not made until April 6, 1917, when Congress met in extraordinary session, it was an almost universally accepted opinion for some time prior to that date that war was inevitable. Diplomatic relations with Germany had been severed on February 3rd, and the situation was hourly growing more tense. During this state of the public mind, the urgent need for more adequate military preparedness was the one uppermost subject of thought and conversation. The latter part of March, with war coming as a moral certainty, found every patriotic citizen eager to see his personal line of duty and his opportunity for service to the country. The Chamberlain Bill for Universal Military Training, which had been left pending when Congress adjourned on March 4th, was then in high favor, and seemed at that time to represent the best judgment of the nation. The imperative need of arousing the public to an appreciation of the tremendous problems involved in preparing for war was evident. A group of Chicago men at the Saddle and Cycle Club were engaged in an informal after-dinner discussion of the war prospect and the Chamberlain Bill, when the importance of developing public sentiment in favor of the Chamberlain Bill became the topic. This discussion brought out the idea of making brief speeches to this effect before picture audiences. One of the men was Donald M. Ryerson, to whom the idea appealed with special force. Another was Senator Medill McCormick, who strongly endorsed the idea and did much to strengthen Ryerson's determination to make it his work to bring the plan into reality. Another with whom the idea was discussed that evening was William McCormick Blair, who promised his support and who afterwards succeeded Mr. Ryerson as national director of the organization. Another was Arthur G. Cable, later decorated for service overseas, 
who gave Mr. Ryerson his immediate and practical assistance in getting the work started. The first form the idea took was that of constituting a patriotic committee to send speakers to motion picture theaters to urge upon the public an appreciation of the importance of military preparedness as then provided in the Chamberlain Bill for universal military training. When it was found that four minutes was the limit of available time for speaking during the intermission in most motion picture theaters, the name Four Minute Men was adopted, carrying with it also a reminder of the patriotic spirit of the Minutemen of the Revolutionary War. Mr. Ryerson's first move was to seek the advice and endorsement of representative citizens. When he was assured by all with whom he consulted that the idea was sound, he made arrangements with the Strand Theatre of Chicago for permission to make a trial four-minute speech. This was done on the evening of March 31, 1917. On April 2nd, Mr. Ryerson invited a group of men to meet for luncheon at the University Club, where he outlined the need and opportunity for patriotic service and the idea of the four-minute men. The meeting ended with a plan of organization agreed upon, with the following officers. Donald M. Ryerson, President, Stephen Gardner, Treasurer, George R. Jones, Secretary, Keith J. Evans, Assistant Secretary. A call for volunteer speakers was issued, and some of those present were enrolled for the work. A temporary office was established at the University Club. Luncheon meetings were held almost daily, and a committee was appointed to arrange a schedule of four-minute talks at motion picture theaters. After a number of speeches had been made by the four-minute men on behalf of the Chamberlain Bill, and after war had been declared, it became evident that the Chamberlain Bill, which did not meet the wartime emergency, was to be dropped, and another bill put forward, known as the Universal Selective Service, and afterwards popularly known as the Draft. This made it necessary to change the plan of the four-minute men. The nation was now at war. The leadership of the president under the wartime powers granted by the Constitution was indisputable, and the need of acting only with the approval of the government became a matter of course. It was plain that all further talk on the Chamberlain bill would be out of order, and until Congress had enacted a law or the president had outlined a policy for civilian activity, it could not be known whether the four-minute men were helping or hindering the plans of the government. A meeting of the four-minute men was called on April 9th, and the situation laid before them. It was the sense of the meeting that Mr. Ryerson should go to Washington and lay before the government his plan for a nationwide organization of public speakers under some form of government control. Accordingly, Mr. Ryerson went immediately to Washington to see what could be done. On April 14, President Wilson had created the Committee on Public Information, and it at once became apparent that if the four-minute men were to obtain a standing as an agency of the government, it must be as a division of this committee. Mr. Ryerson interviewed George Creel, the newly appointed chairman of the Committee on Public Information, who in turn secured for the plan the approval of the president, and on April 20 Mr. Ryerson telegraphed to his associates in Chicago that he had written arrangements with Mr. Creel which placed the four-minute men on an official basis as a division of the Committee on Public Information. The control of the organization at first remained vested in the original committee in Chicago. The first subject, Universal Selective Service, together with typical arguments to be advanced by speakers, were approved in Washington by Mr. Creel before being released to the speakers. It was soon found, however, that the national headquarters for the work must be established in Washington. This was done on June 16. At that time, Mr. Ryerson, who had previously received a commission in the Navy, and who had secured a two-months leave in order to establish the work of the four-minute men, relinquished control of the organization. William McCormick Blair of Chicago was then appointed National Director of Four Minute Men and took up his residence in Washington. The responsibilities of national leadership, although still vested in Chicago men, 
thus passed to washington and chicago thereafter took its rank as one of the local units of the national organization the subsequent history of the four minute men of chicago is that of a unit acting under the general direction of the national headquarters at washington as a division of the committee on public information two the period of service the second period in the history of the four minute men of chicago dates from the reorganization on june sixteenth nineteen seventeen to the conclusion of the work on december twenty fourth nineteen eighteen the chicago members were organized into a local unit and george r jones was appointed chicago chairman by the national director in him was vested all authority and responsibility so far as relations with the national organization were concerned this was in accordance with the standard plan of the national organization each local chairman receiving an official appointment which carried with it the complete authority necessary to the conduct of the work the plan of local organization worked out in chicago included much that was afterwards adopted by the national organization as the standard plan for all local chairmen to follow and also many features that remained peculiar to chicago the authority vested in the chicago chairman was delegated by him to committees covering every branch of the work and the chairmen of all committees together constituted the chicago governing committee all matters of policy affecting the work were discussed and voted upon by the committee although the power to veto necessarily remained with the chairman in order to fulfill his personal responsibilities to the government this plan gave at once the advantage of centralized and unquestioned authority and the wisdom and interest of a large board one of the necessities of the work was that each local unit should be financed by local contributions preferably from a few patriotic persons able to give generously rather than by appeal to the public in view of this plan it was a matter of great service to the four minute men of chicago that samuel insull afterwards chairman of the illinois state council of defense gave the use of offices and equipment in the edison building and later secured for the work the support of the state council of defense the monday luncheon meetings which began with the inception of the work in chicago continued throughout the entire period to be the center and inspiration for four minute men and was largely adopted in other local organizations throughout the country these luncheon meetings were held at first at the grand pacific hotel but later and for the remainder of the period at the morrison hotel the program usually consisted of one or more addresses by speakers of note always on some topic of interest in connection with the war open meetings were also held upon occasion giving any member an opportunity to raise any topic and also giving all an opportunity to hear representative four-minute speeches then being delivered by some of their fellow speakers the various committees met as occasion demanded and called for a great amount of hard work and patriotic sacrifice of time these committees were chicago governing committee composed of the chairman of all other committees advised on all matters of policy admissions committee passed on the qualifications of applicants for membership assignment committee arranged the schedule for speakers and theaters speaking committee visited theaters and reported on the work of individual speakers speakers conference committee assisted individual speakers in perfecting their work theater committee arranged for the cooperation of the theaters program committee arranged the programs for the monday luncheons and other meetings publicity committee represented the organization in its relations with the press liberty loan theater committee arranged for speaking in regular theaters during the liberty loan drives committee representing regular theaters advisory committee representing motion picture industry advisory public school committee arranged for speaking at public schools public parks committee arranged for speaking in parks during the summer amusement parks committee arranged for speaking in amusement parks during the summer church section arranged with ministers to use the official bulletins for patriotic talks to their congregations 
Convention Section, arranged for speaking at various conventions being held in Chicago. Fraternal Section, arranged for speaking in various secret societies and fraternal meetings. Labor Union Section, arranged for speaking at labor union meetings. Wabash Avenue Section, arranged for speaking by colored men to colored audiences. For the first year after the work began in Chicago, George R. Jones was Chicago chairman and also state director for Illinois. But the work of organizing the 435 towns in the state so often required his absence from the city and made such demands on his time that Mr. Jones finally relinquished the active supervision of the Chicago branch, although continuing to serve as a member of the governing committee. He was succeeded by Ernest Palmer, who was appointed Chicago chairman on March 25, 1918. Throughout the remainder of the war period, Mr. Palmer was the conspicuous and dominant figure of the organization, and the work in Chicago owed much of its spirit and success to his exceptional ability and unfailing geniality. The topics for speaking were governed by bulletins sent out from national headquarters, fixing the period of their use and providing a budget of facts and typical arguments to assist speakers in preparing their speeches. Thirty-seven of these bulletins were issued, each usually representing a new subject, although some subjects required two or more bulletins. These bulletins were issued in the following order and were used during the period named. Universal Service by Selective Draft, May 12-21, 1917. First Liberty Loan, May 22-June to June 15. Red Cross, June 18-25. Food Conservation, July 1-14. Why We Are Fighting, July 23-August to August 5. The Nation in Arms, August 6-26. The Importance of Speed, August 19-26. What Our Enemy Really Is, August 27 to September 23. Unmasking German Propaganda, August 27 to September 23. Onward to Victory, September 24 to October 27. Second Liberty Loan, October 8 to 28. Food Pledge, October 29 to November 4. Maintaining Morals and Morale, November 12 to 25. Carrying the Message, November 26 to December 22. War Savings Stamps, January 2 to 19, 1918. The Shipbuilder, January 28 to February 9. Eyes for the Navy, February 11 to 16. The Danger to Democracy, February 18 to March 10. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, February 12. The Income Tax, March 11 to 16. Farm and Garden, March 25 to 30. President Wilson's Letter to Theaters, March 31 to April 5. Third Liberty Loan, April 6 to May 4. Second Red Cross Campaign, May 13 to 25. Danger to America, May 27 to June 12. Second War Savings Campaign, June 24 to 28. The Meaning of America, June 29 to July 27. Mobilizing America's Manpower, July 29 to August 17. Where Did You Get Your Facts? August 26 to September 7. Register, September 5 to 12. Fourth Liberty Loan, September 28 to October 19. Fire Prevention, October 27 to November 2. United War Work Campaign, November 3 to 18. Red Cross Home Service, December 7. What We Have Won, December 8 to 14. Red Cross Christmas Roll Call, December 5 to 23. A Tribute to the Allies, December 24, 1918. A number of special events of more than ordinary interest to the Four Minute Men were held during the lifetime of the organization. Of these may be mentioned, Friday, November 9, 1917, get-together dinner, field day, and entertainment at the Edgewater Golf Club. December 24, 1917, Monday luncheon in the ballroom of the Morrison Hotel. Guest of honor, Captain Paul Paragord, 
special representative of the French government. February 5, 1918. Get together dinner at the Stevens Building Cafe. Guest of honor, Donald M. Ryerson, founder of the Four Minute Men. May 6, 1918. Get together dinner at the Midday Club. May 29, 1918. Luncheon in honor of 103 French Blue Devils in the ballroom of the Morrison Hotel, which was supplemented by an automobile drive through the city and a reception to the public at the auditorium in the evening under the auspices of the Four Minute Men. November 11, 1918. Armistice Celebration Luncheon at the Morrison Hotel. Guest of Honor, Honorable William Howard Taft. Songs for the Occasion by the Liberty Chorus. November 22, 1918. Victory Dinner in the Ballroom of the Hotel La Salle. A festival occasion designed to mark the official close of the work, although speaking assignments continued until December 24. Guest of Honor, William H. Ingersoll. National Director of the Four Minute Men. December 16, 1919. Final Monday Luncheon. Farewell Address by Samuel Insall, Chairman of the State Council of Defense. Permanent Organization. A resolution was passed at the Victory Dinner at Hotel La Salle, November 22, 1918, providing for a permanent organization of the Four Minute Men of Chicago as an honorary body to perpetuate the friendships formed during the period of service. The incumbent officers were chosen to continue the organization, to which were specially added the names of Donald M. Ryerson, William McCormick Blair, and George R. Jones. The Chicago Governing Committee, with Ernest Palmer chairman, accepted their further responsibilities under the resolution, and elected to their number those who in the past had served as members of this committee. It was the sentiment of the members present at the victory dinner that an annual reunion dinner should be provided for, the matter being left in the hands of the Governing Committee. Facts and Figures Four Minute Men of Chicago Number of speakers enrolled, 451. Workers who served on governing committee, 48. Total workers on committees, 120. Theaters cooperating, 314. Members who served in army or navy, 50. Killed in action, 3. Speakers in the fraternal section, 350. Speakers in the labor section, 70. Speakers in the church section, 490. Reserve speakers, 44. Number of speaking campaigns, 37. Number of speeches made in Chicago, 50,000. Total of audiences reached, estimated, 25 million. Monday luncheon meetings held, 84. Standing committees, 20. President Wilson's Letters to the Four-Minute Men 1. The White House, Washington, November 9, 1917. To the 15,000 four-minute men of the United States. May I not express my very real interest in the vigorous and intelligent work your organization is doing in connection with the Committee on Public Information? It is surely a matter worthy of sincere appreciation that a body of thoughtful citizens, with the hearty cooperation of the managers of moving picture theaters, are engaged in the presentation and discussion of the purposes and measures of these critical days. Men and nations are at their worst, or at their best, in any great struggle. The spoken word may light the fires of passion and unreason, or it may inspire to highest action and noblest sacrifice a nation of free men. Upon you four-minute men, who are charged with a special duty and enjoy a special privilege in the command of your audiences, will rest in a considerable degree the task of arousing and informing the great body of our people, so that when the record of these days is complete, we shall read page for page with the deeds of army and navy, the story of the unity, the spirit of sacrifice, the unceasing labors, the high courage of the men and women at home who hold unbroken the inner lines. My best wishes and continuing interest are with you in your work as part of the Reserve Officer Corps in a nation thrice armed, because through your efforts it knows better the justice of its cause 
and the value of what it defends. Cordially and sincerely yours, Woodrow Wilson. 2. The White House, Washington, November 20, 1918. To all the four-minute men of the Committee on Public Information. I have read with real interest the report of your activities, and I wish to express my sincere appreciation of the value to the government of your effective and inspiring efforts. It is a remarkable record of patriotic accomplishment that an organization of 75,000 speakers should have carried on so extensive a work at a cost to the government of little more than $100,000 for the 18-month period, less than one dollar yearly on an individual basis. Each member of your organization, in receiving honorable discharge from the service, may justly feel a glow of proper pride in the part that he has played in holding fast the inner lines. May I say that I, personally, have always taken the deepest and most sympathetic interest in your work, and have noted from time to time the excellent results you have procured for the various departments of the government. Now that this work has come to its conclusion, and the name of the Four Minute Men, which I venture to hope will not be used henceforth by any similar organization, has become a part of the history of the Great War, I would not willingly omit my heartfelt testimony to its great value to the country, and indeed to civilization as a whole, during our period of national trial and triumph. I shall always keep in memory the patriotic cooperation and assistance accorded me throughout this period, and shall remain deeply and sincerely grateful to all who, like yourselves, have aided so nobly in the achievement of our aims." Cordially and sincerely yours, Woodrow Wilson. The part of the four-minute man. I am a four-minute man. I am the mouthpiece of democracy. I make men think. I wield the most potent power of human endeavor, the spoken word. The blind do not read. The ignorant cannot read. The dullard will not read. But all men must hearken to my message. My appeal is universal, elemental, primitive. I was a roving shepherd. I came back to my tribe and told of a far country green with pastures. My message reached Abraham. He led his tribe forth and founded a great people, Israel. Again, I was a nomad slave. I returned to my people, groaning under the fetters of Pharaoh, and told of a beautiful land beyond the desert. My tidings came to the ears of Moses, and he led his chosen people to the promised land. Again I was a wandering monk. To the high and low, I brought the tale of the Holy Land, suffering under Moslem oppression. My appeal inspired the great crusade. Again I was a wayfaring mariner, spreading strange rumors of unknown lands beyond the seas. Columbus heard my message set sail and discovered a new world thus it is that the destinies of humanity have been swayed and directed by the spoken word today my appeal is more compelling more potent more universal than ever i am a stoker for the great melting pot in four minutes i breathe the flame of true american patriotism to people of all kinds and creeds i am a soldier I fight German propaganda, intrigue, falsehoods, treachery. I am a teacher. I set forth in 240 seconds lessons in loyalty, duty, thrift, conservation, cooperation. I am a herald. I sound the clarion call for men to serve their country. I summon up help for the YMCA and the Red Cross. I am a salesman. I sell liberty bonds and thrift stamps. I am a preacher. Using the text that all men are equal, I invoke loyalty, patriotism, devotion. I am a doctor. I give four-minute treatments for disloyalty, un-Americanism, selfishness, laziness. I eradicate apathy and listlessness, and instill pep and enthusiasm. I am a lawyer. Before a jury of all races and creeds, I indict old-world standards of caste, class distinction, privileges, and false pride. I am an efficiency engineer. 
I plead for the elimination of waste and carelessness and the practice of economy and conservation. I am an optimist. I have faith in the triumph of truth and right over might and brute force. I am a prophet. I predict the doom of despotism and autocracy and the triumph of liberty and democracy. I am a lover. I love the stars and stripes. I love to think that this nation under God is having a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. I am the mouthpiece of democracy. I make men think. I am a four-minute man. Note, this composition was awarded a prize offered by the state chairman for Illinois for the best manuscript on The Part of the Four-Minute Man in the War. The author is Fred A. Wirth, one of the Four Minute Men of Chicago. End of The Four Minute Men of Chicago by The History Committee of the Four Minute Men of Chicago. Harriet Hosmer by Anonymous from Cosmopolitan Art Journal, December 1859. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Born at Watertown, Massachusetts, October 9, 1830, Harriet Hosmer is the only surviving daughter of Dr. Hiram Hosmer, an eminent physician of that place, who, having lost wife and child by consumption, and fearing a like fate for the survivor, gave her horse, dog, gun, and boat, and insisted upon an outdoors life as indispensable to health. A fearless horsewoman, a good shot, an adept in rowing, swimming, diving, and skating, Harriet is a signal instance of what judicious physical training will effect in conquering even hereditary taint of constitution. Willingly as the active, energetic child acquiesced in her father's wishes, she contrived at the same time to gratify and develop her own peculiar tastes. And many a time and oft, when the worthy doctor may have flattered himself that his darling was an active exercise, she might have been found in a certain clay pit, not very far from the paternal residence, making early attempts at modeling horses, dogs, sheep, men, and women, any objects, in short, which attracted her attention. Then, too, both here and subsequently at Lenox, she made good use of her time by studying natural history and of her gun by securing specimens for herself of the wild creatures of the woods, feathered and furred, dissecting some, and, with her own hands, preparing and stuffing others. The walls of the room devoted to her special use in the old house at home are covered with birds, bats, butterflies, and beetles, snakes and toads, while sundry bottles of spirits contain subjects carefully dissected and prepared by herself. Full of fun and frolic, Numerous anecdotes are told of practical jokes perpetrated to such an excess that Dr. Hosmer, satisfied with the progress toward health and strength his child had made, and having endeavored without success to place her under tuition in daily and weekly schools near home, determined to commit her to the care of Mrs. Sedgwick of Lenox, Massachusetts. Thither the young lady was accordingly sent, with strict injunctions that health should be a paramount consideration and that the pupil should have liberty to ride and walk, shoot and swim, to her heart's content. In wiser or kinder hands the girl could not have been placed. Here, too, she met with Mrs. Fanny Kemble, whose influence tended to strengthen and develop her already decided tastes and predilections. To Mrs. Kemble we have heard the young artist gratefully attribute the encouragement which decided her to follow sculpture as a profession, and to devote herself and her life to the pursuit of art. In 1850, she left Lenox. Mrs. Sedgwick's judicious treatment and the motive and encouragement supplied by Mrs. Kemble had given the right impetus to that activity of mind and body which needed only guiding and directing into legitimate channels. She returned to her father's house at Watertown to pursue her art studies and to fit herself for the career she had resolved upon following. The life of the young girl was now full of earnest purpose and noble ambition and the untiring energy and perseverance which distinguish her now in so remarkable a degree were at this time evidenced and developed. Having modeled one or two copies from the antique, she next tried her hand on a portrait bust, 
then cut Canova's bust of Napoleon in marble, working it entirely with her own hands that she might make herself mistress of the process. Her father, seeing her devoted to her studies, seconded them in every possible way, and proposed to send her to his friend, Dr. McDowell, professor of anatomy to the St. Louis College, that she might go through a course of regular instruction and be thus thoroughly grounded for the branch of art she had chosen. The young artist was but too glad to close with the offer, and in the autumn of 1850 we find her at St. Louis, residing in the family of her favorite schoolmate from Lenox, winning the hearts of all its members by her frank, joyous nature and steady application, and securing in the head of it what she heartily and energetically calls the best friend I ever had. Dr. McDowell, charmed with the talent and earnestness of his pupil, afforded her every facility in his power, giving her the freedom of the college at all times, and occasionally bestowing upon her a private lecture, when she attended to see him prepare dissections for the public ones. Pleasant and encouraging it is to find men of ability and eminence so willing to help a woman when she is willing to help herself. The career of this young artist hitherto has been marked by the warm and generous encouragement of men like Professor McDowell and John Gibson, the sculptor, and pleasant it is to find the affectionate and grateful appreciation of such kindness, converting the temporary tie of master and pupil into the permanent one of tried and valued friendship. Through the winter and spring of 1851, in fact, during the whole term, Harriet Hosmer prosecuted her studies with unremitting zeal and attention, and at the close was presented with a diploma. During her stay at St. Louis, and as a testimony of her gratitude and regard, Miss Hosmer cut, from a bust of Professor McDowell by Clevenger, a medallion in marble life-size which is now in the museum of the college. It is, perhaps, worthy of note that Clevenger and Powers both studied anatomy under this professor. After graduating, she was determined to see something of the world, and all alone she went to New Orleans, which was thoroughly explored. Returning up the river, she passed on to the falls of St. Anthony, and had many an adventure. The trip added to her good health and spirits. She returned home in the summer of 1851, and immediately set to work to model an ideal bust of Hesper, continuing her anatomical studies, and employing her intervals of leisure and rest in reading, writing, and boating. Now followed a period of earnest work, cheered and inspired by those visions of success, of purpose fulfilled, of high aims realized, which haunt the young and enthusiastic aspirant, and throw a halo round the youthful days of genius, which lends a color to the whole career. To go to Rome, to make herself acquainted with all the treasures of art, ancient and modern, to study and work as the masters of both periods had studied and worked before her, this was now our youthful artist's ambition, and all the while she labored heart and soul at Hesper, the first creation of her genius, watching its growth beneath her hand as a young mother watches step by step the progress of her firstborn, kneading in with the plastic clay all those thousand hopes and fears which, turn by turn, charm and agitate all who aspire. At length, the clay model finished, a block of marble was sought and found and brought home to the shed in the garden hitherto appropriated to dissecting purposes, but now fitted up as a studio. Here, with her own small hands, the youthful maiden, short of stature, and delicate in make, anything but robust in health, with chisel and mallet, blocked out the bust, and subsequently, with rasp and file, finished it to the last degree of manipulative perfection. Months and months it took, and hours and days of quiet toil and patience, but those wings of genius, perseverance, and industry were hers, and love lent zest to the work. It was late summer in 1852, before Hesper was fully completed. September 29, 1852, father and daughter sailed for Europe, the St. Louis diploma and Dagra types of Hesper being carefully stowed away in the safest corner of the portmanteau, as evidences of what the young artist had already achieved. When arrived at Rome, she should seek the instruction of one of two masters whose fame worldwide could alone satisfy our aspirant's ambition. So eager was her desire to reach Rome that a week only was given to England, when, joining some friends in Paris, the whole party proceeded to Rome, arriving in the Eternal City on the evening of November 12, 1852. 
Within two days, the daguerreotypes were placed in the hands of Mr. Gibson, as he sat at breakfast in the Café Greco, a famous place of resort for artists. In less than a week, Harriet Hosmer was fairly installed in Mr. Gibson's studio, and where she still is. It is difficult, however, for master and pupil, or we should rather say, for the two friends to part. For, spite of the difference of years, or perhaps in consequence of it, a truly paternal and filial affection has sprung up between the two, a source of great happiness to themselves, and of pleasure and amusement to all who know and value them, from the curious likeness yet unlikeness which existed from the first in Miss Hosmer to Mr. Gibson, and which daily intercourse has not tended to lessen. Her first winter in Rome was passed in modelling from the antique, Mr. Gibson desiring to assure himself of the correctness of Miss Hosmer's eye, and the soundness of her knowledge, Hesper evincing the possession of the imaginative and creative power. From the first, Mr. Gibson expressed himself more than satisfied with her power of imitating the roundness and softness of flesh, saying upon one occasion that he had never seen it surpassed and not often equaled. Her first attempt at original design in Rome was a bust of Daphne, quickly succeeded by another of the Medusa, the beautiful Medusa, and a lovely thing it is, faultless in form and intense in its expression of horror and agony, without trenching on the physically painful. We've already spoken of the warm friend Miss Hosmer made for herself during her winter at St. Louis, in the head of a family at whose house she was a guest. This gentleman, as a godspeed to the young artist on her journey to Rome, sent her, on the eve of departure, an order to a large amount for the first figure she should model, leaving her entirely free to select her own time and subject. A statue of Enon was the result, which is now in the house of Mr. Crow at St. Louis, and which gave such satisfaction to its possessor and his fellow townsmen that an order was forwarded to Miss Hosmer for a statue for the public library at St. Louis, on the same liberal and considerate terms. Beatrice Cenci, which won so many golden opinions from critics and connoisseurs, was in fulfillment of this order. The third summer still found her at Rome. Some little reverses in her father's money matters induced him to suggest the propriety of the daughter's return home for a while, and the summons came as she was just on the eve of departure to England, to spend the hot fever months of the Campania. With her characteristic decision, she resolved not to go home and desert her art. The journey to England was immediately given up, and she arranged to remain in Rome during the dangerous season of malaria, to work and earn money as well as reputation. Hitherto, all her wants had been supplied. Now she could not only supply herself, but also help others. The summer passed, and Harriet was spared any illness. She labored with an enthusiasm and energy truly marvelous. The fruit of this labor was the exquisite statue of Puck, one of the most charming and spirited of all compositions. So popular has it become that it has since been repeated several times, the last for the young Prince of Wales, who honored the maiden's studio with a special visit. One copy is also in the possession of the Duke of Hamilton. The original was ordered by and is now in possession of Samuel Hooper, Esquire, of Boston. Puck was followed by the Beatrice Cenci, and a recumbent life-size figure for the monument of a beautiful young woman who died in Rome and is buried in the church of San Andreo della Fraccio in the Via Mercede, close upon the Piazza di Spagna. This work has excited great admiration. It is death touchingly rendered, beauty rarely interpreted. This monument was composed while the Cenci was being put into marble. Of the Cenci, we need not speak at length. Its exhibition in this country has served to render the sculptor's name a familiar one, and served to give the American public some idea of her capacity and genius. It is a life-size of the unfortunate woman whose terrible tragedy is told so touchingly by Shelley, and more recently by Guarazzi in his novel of Beatrice Cenci. The moment chosen is the night before her execution, when, overcome by her despair and unmerited fortune, she falls upon her couch for sleep. The figure reclines upon the bench, the limbs dropping to the floor, the hair disheveled, the face of suffering, yet of a nobility in expression which marks the true woman. This statue is now in the St. Louis Mercantile Library rooms, the property of Mr. Crow. The last and greatest of Miss Hosmer's work is her Zenobia, which is thus referred to by Mrs. Lydia M. Child. 
Quote, the statue of Zenobia is larger than life size. The head is covered with a helmet fashioned like a tiara in the front, suggested by a medal of the Palmyrene Queen in the British Museum. Under this, in keeping with the royal costumes of the East, is a gemmed fillet, the ends of which fall among her curls and meet in a pleasing line, the ornamented chinte crossed upon the breast. The left hand clutches the chain fastened to her wrist by manacles in the shape of bracelets. On the right arm, which falls naturally and easily by her side, is visible a thin sleeve looped up in Amazonian fashion. Over this first dress is a shorter robe of thicker material. The ample folds of a rich mantle, fastened on the shoulders with gems, breaks up the monotonous outline of the more closely fitting garments. The whole costume is a charming combination of Grecian grace with oriental magnificence. In the position of the feet and limbs, the artist seems to me to have accomplished the exceedingly difficult task of making a just poise between action and repose. It indicates precisely the slow, measured tread natural to a stately person walking in a procession. The expression of the beautiful face is admirably conceived. It is sad, but calm and very proud, the expression of a great soul, whose regal majesty no misfortune could dethrone. Miss Hosmer, in a letter accompanying the photograph, writes, I have tried to make her too proud to exhibit passion or emotion of any kind, not subdued, though a prisoner, but calm, grand, and strong within herself. I think the public will agree that she has successfully embodied this high ideal of her superb subject. End of quote. Besides these works, Miss Hosmer has executed several busts, medallions, etc., which are marked by many excellencies. Among them may be named Bust of the Lady of Lewis Cass, Jr., Medallion of Dr. McDowell of St. Louis, Medallion Head of Lady Constance Talbot, etc. She has, in model, a companion piece to Puck in The Willow the Wisp, said to exceed even the Puck in its spirit, grace, and power of expression. Miss Hosmer visited America in the summer of 1858 after the completion and shipment hence of her Chenchi. Her reception was indeed cordial. In New York she was a guest of Reverend Dr. Bellows, who gave, through Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, a good sketch of her life and labors. She is now in Rome, still in her Gibson studio, which has been enlarged for her purposes, and should her life and health be spared, the public have great reason to expect from her hands works which will not fail to render her renowned and give her position with the most eminent of modern sculptors. The portrait prefixed to this sketch is furnished us by Dr. Hosmer, and is therefore perfectly authentic. It is from a photograph taken in Rome. The lady is in her studio costume, with her tools in her hand and a statue at her side. We have succeeded in giving a good reproduction of her figure. End of Harriet Hosmer by Anonymous Recorded by Colleen McMahon The Laws of Shotoku Taishi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Laws of Shotoku Taishi. 1. Harmony shall be esteemed and obedience shall be held in regard. Because dissensions prevail, Therefore men are often unfaithful to their prince and disobedient to their fathers. Let adjoining districts be left in peace, thus harmony between superior and inferior shall be cultivated, and cooperation in matters of state shall be promoted, and thus the right reason of all things may be reached and the right thing accomplished. 2. Let bountiful honour be always paid to the three precious elements of Buddhism, that is, to its priests, its ritual, and its founder. It is the highest religion in the universe, and all people in all generations must pay becoming reverence to its doctrines. Do not harshly censor men's wickedness, but teach them faithfully until they yield obedience. Unless men rely upon Buddhism, there is no way to convert them from the wrong to the right. 3. 
To the commands of the emperor men must be duly obedient. The prince must be looked upon as the heaven and its subjects as the earth. The earth contains all things and the heaven stretches over it. The four seasons pass orderly along and the spirit of the universe is harmonious. If the earth were to cover the heaven the effect would be distraction. Hence the prince must command and the subject obey. Superiors must act and inferiors yield. Men ought therefore to pay due heed to the orders of the emperor. If not, they will bring ruin on themselves. 4. Politeness must be the chief rule of conduct for all officers and their colleagues in the court. The first principle governing subjects must be politeness. When superiors are not polite, then inferiors will not keep in the right. When inferiors are not polite, their conduct degenerates into crime. When both prince and subjects are polite, then social order is never disturbed and the state is kept in a condition of tranquillity. 5. Covetousness and rapacity must be expelled from the hearts of officers and they must adjudicate with just discrimination in all suits that come before them. Even in a single day there are thousands of such suits, and in the course of years how great must be the accumulation. If the suit is won through bribery, then the poor man can obtain no justice, but only the rich. The poor man will have no sure place of dependence, and subjects will be driven to abandon their duty. 6. To punish vice and to encourage virtue is the rule in good ancient law. The virtuous man must therefore be promoted, and the vicious man must be surely punished. The man who is untruthful is a powerful instrument to endanger the state and a keen weapon to destroy the nation. The flatterer loves to tell the faults of the inferior to the superior, and also to disclose the errors of the superior to the inferior. Such men are alike unfaithful to the prince and unfriendly to fellow citizens, and in the end fail not to stir up social disorder. 7. The duty of men in the government must be assigned according to their capacity. When intelligent men take service, the applause of the people follows, but when bad men are in office, calamities ensue. If wise officers are put on duty, the matters of state are well managed, and the community is free from danger and prosperity prevails. Therefore, in ancient times the wise king never selected the office for the man, but always selected the man to suit the office. 8. Too often officers and their colleagues come early to their offices and retire soon, so that the public work accomplished in a single day is small. It is incumbent on them to devote sufficient time to their tasks. If not, then the work of the government cannot be done. 9. Everything must be faithfully done, because fidelity is the origin of justice. The distinction between good and bad, between success and failure, depends on fidelity. When both prince and subjects are faithful, then there are no duties which cannot be accomplished, but when both are unfaithful, nothing can be done. 10. Give up all thoughts of indignation and be not angered with others on account of a disagreement of opinion. Each one may have a different point of view and may therefore come to a different conclusion. If the one side be right, then the other must be wrong, or the cases may be just reversed. It would be unjust to set down one man as surely wise and another as positively stupid, because men cannot attain perfection in their characters. It is impossible to decide either side to be perfectly right or perfectly wrong. While you are angry with another who has a different view from you, you cannot be sure lest you be in the wrong. Therefore, though you may think yourself in the right, 
it is safer to follow the opinions of the many. 11. Let merit and demerit be carefully considered, and let rewards and punishments be meted out accordingly. In times past this has often failed to be justly done. It is incumbent on all who are entrusted with the direction of public affairs, and on all officers of the government to look carefully after the distribution of rewards and punishments. 12. Governors of provinces and their deputies must be careful not to impose too heavy duties on their subjects. One state never has more than one prince, and in like manner the subjects cannot have more than one master. The prince is the head of all his dominions and of all his subjects. The officers of government are also the subjects of the prince, and there is no reason why they should dare to lay undue burdens upon others who are subjects of the same prince. 13. Each officer of the government has his appointed duty. Sometimes officers complain of the stagnation of business, which, however, is caused by their own absence from their appointed duties. They must not make a pretense of the performance of their duties and by their neglect interrupt public affairs. 14. Subjects and officers must not be jealous of each other. If one person is envious of another, the second is sure to be envious of the first. Thus the evils of jealousy never end. If men shall envy each other on account of their talent and wisdom, no single wise man would ever be obtained for government service through a thousand years. What a noble method of governing a state would that be, which expelled from its service all wise men? 15. To sacrifice private interests for the public good is the duty of the subject. When men are selfish, there must be ill-will. When ill-will comes, then with it must come iniquity, which will disturb the public welfare. Ill-will is sure to bring about the breaking of wholesome rules and the violation of the laws of the state. It is for this reason that the harmony between superior and inferior spoken of in the first article is so important. 16. To select a convenient season in which to employ men for public work is the rule of good ancient law. Winter is a time of leisure, but during the season between spring and autumn, in which they are employed on their farms and in feeding silkworms, it is not expedient to take men from their work or interfere with them in their efforts to supply food and clothing. 17. Important matters should only be settled after due conference with many men. Trifling matters may be decided without conference, because they are not so material in their effects. But weighty matters, on account of their far-reaching consequences, must be discussed with many counsellors. It is thus that the right way shall be found and pursued. End of The Laws of Shotoku Taishi Natural Man by Arthur B. Moss this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Natural Man by Arthur B. Moss Concerning the when and how of the origin of man, nothing positive is known. Genesis states that God made man but as the greatest intellects of modern times doubt the existence of deity, a ready acceptance of the mosaic account of the creation of the human species can only take place among those who are not well qualified to weigh evidence, balance probabilities, and appraise the evidence of rival theories. The researches of men of science lead us to the belief that the authors of the first and second chapters of Genesis were mistaken. They formulated a theory and imagined it to be a fact. Darwin, Haeckel, Huxley, and other eminent scientists dispute altogether the theory that man was created perfect, 
and in their works have proved to demonstration that the beings called men have evolved from lower organisms, that they have the same anatomical structure as the Catarini apes, that there is a distinct blood relationship between them, and that they have both had a common parentage. To establish the truth of the evolution theory, it is enough to look fairly at the facts of nature. To observe man under various aspects, to consider him in barbaric times, or in countries where he is not yet civilized, to see him in a nude condition, with nothing to cover him but a mass of hair which nature provides, to watch him in his struggle for life with his enemies, the destructive lower animals, and his fellow men, and to find in the course of years that a higher form of man has evolved out of this barbaric creature. The evolution theory accounts for the facts as they are observed in life, facts which upon any other theory are quite inexplicable. And it must not be supposed that because the theory does not give a complete explanation to all the phenomena that it therefore is not reliable. Heckel says, Pedigree of Man, page 36, If we can only prove the general truth of the Darwinian theory, our idea of the origin of man from lower vertebrata follows of necessity, and we are not obliged to give a special proof as to this latter view if the general proposition is well established. That the general proposition is well established is now admitted by the most enlightened of the opponents of Darwinism. What is called the evolution theory is generally acknowledged to be removed from the region of hypothesis to that of fact. But it is not my purpose further to pursue the subject of man's origin, which, while it is confessedly a most interesting question, is one upon which no man who is not a skilled scientist can write or speak with authority. I can only deal with probabilities. Nobody, so far as we know, was present to witness the first man spring into existence. Indeed, we do not know that there was a first man, and if there was a first, it does not follow that he was conscious of being made, or when he was completed that he had the pleasure of seeing his maker, who told him how it was done. Or, on the other hand, if he were evolved from some lower creature, it does not follow that he was conscious of the evolution. But at least we can be sure that history speaks with no uncertain sound concerning man's progress in the world and the means by which it was achieved. As a civilized creature, man is not many centuries old. Even now we find many savage races existing on the earth, and in type so low in the scale are they that they more nearly resemble the brute beasts, both in intellect and in physique, than the higher forms of men. Now if we would study the progress of the human race to any advantage, we must study it apart from all prejudice, and not allow religious or superstitious notions concerning the superiority of one class of people to warp our minds and prevent us from understanding the important part played by savage peoples in the battle of life. For it must always be remembered that man's history is one of fearful warfare, not only between men and men, but between man and the lower animals. It is no flight of the imagination to say that there exist the clearest proofs that man many ages ago lived in holes in the earth and went in constant fear of animals who sought him as their prey. Sometimes he would have to scramble up trees to elude the vigilance of these sagacious beasts. Sometimes the tree would form no place of safety and he would have to run for dear life or become a living sacrifice to these savage beings. In the course of time, man learnt how to keep himself warm, while the beasts of the field perished from cold or parched with thirst and famished with hunger, sunk and died. He learned how to huddle himself up close to a fire in his mud hut, out of all danger from the enemy. In addition to this, he learnt how to speak to communicate his thoughts to his fellows. There were great steps in advance. Man was still in a nude condition, but now he began to form a theory as to the cause of the phenomena of the universe. He began to establish the reign of the gods, 
all his gods naturally enough at first were fetishes those animals which he considered superior to himself he elected as special objects of worship as soon as he found that these were not superior but inferior to himself he began to make gods after his own image out of the small tribes in course of ages grew great nations men could now manufacture weapons of destruction with which they could procure food and destroy their enemies thus little by little were built up the nations of the earth all advance all progress toward civilization made by primitive man was made by opposing with all his strength and skill the destructive forces of nature and by strenuous attempts at improving upon human nature itself was man then inherently depraved and prone to evil continually not so the germs of evil and good were alike sown in his nature and if either of these was developed by favorable circumstances an evil or a good result followed of necessity that man was not depraved by nature is seen by the fact that in the general evolution of things instead of growing worse he has continued to improve from the low brutal and immoral creature of the past to the purer loftier nobler being the highest that can be found today in his natural state it is true man was a wicked being he had no intuitive knowledge of right and wrong he had to perform an act and he was never sure until he felt the results whether it was good or bad in his natural state he was dirty untruthful unjust no god came to tell him that cleanliness was next to godliness nor admonish him to be truthful and just in all his dealings he was left alone to use his own unaided intelligence as best he might to test the truth of these assertions one has only to turn to savage races existing today it will be found on investigation that not only are they unclean in their habits and destitute of any idea of justice but for the most part they are unblushing liars and ingenious thieves all the characteristics in human nature that are called virtues are purely of artificial growth and result from man's cultivation of his better self or in other words from his improvement upon nature's spontaneous course of action in support of this view i may here quote j s mill who says essays on nature page forty eight children and the lower classes of most countries seem to be actually fond of dirt the vast majority of the human race are indifferent to it whole nations of otherwise civilized and cultivated human beings tolerate it in some of its worst forms and only a very small minority are consistently offended by it indeed the universal law of the subject appears to be that uncleanliness offends only those to whom it is unfamiliar so that those who have lived in so artificial a state as to be unused to it in any form are the sole persons whom it disgusts in all forms of all virtues this is the most evidently not instinctive but a triumph over instinct assuredly neither cleanliness nor the love of cleanliness is natural to man but only the capacity of acquiring a love of cleanliness on page fifty seven the same writer declares that savages are always liars they have not the faintest notion of truth as a virtue having then all these bad qualities of nature how is it that man has been able to put them into subjection and advance along the road to civilization even at the pace that we have seen such advance has been wholly dependent upon the energy and skill with which he has opposed the destructive forces of nature using one law to counteract another and upon the determination with which he has striven to improve upon human nature itself for centuries man groped about in the dark nature was deaf to his appeals and blind to his sufferings and her daily performances frightened and bewildered him and yet he did his best to ascertain the causes of the phenomena of the universe but his best guesses were wide of the mark 
Outside of nature he sought for explanation. He thought he had scaled nature's heights and fathomed her debts when he had merely gazed a few miles into the vast expanse of space above. And when the most learned among them declared that God was the author of the universe, a great theological enterprise commenced. Every nation started a god on its own account, and if one proved to be insufficient, a few more were easily drafted in, with a devil to keep them company. These gods and devils, which were material or spiritual, according as occasion required, were hereafter put forward as explanations of nature's workings. And the people believed in them. How could they do otherwise? Their credulity was perfectly natural. They could not investigate. All their faculties were untrained. Even the most learned among them were superlatively ignorant, incapable by virtue of an untrained mind of accurately perceiving, recording, remembering, or judging of nature's manifold manifestations. And so the theologian has a good time of it. He believed thoroughly in his own pretensions, believed that he possessed the key which opened the door of all mysteries, that he was a God-appointed teacher of men, and in all the countries of the world he was looked upon as second only in importance to the gods themselves. But all this time the people were anxious to know not only what sort of deity it was they worshipped, but what kind of action would be likely to win his favor. They were told that God was a jealous being, and that their first duty was obedience to his will. They believed it. When, therefore, they were instructed to slaughter their neighbors who worshipped a different deity, they went to the task with all the ardor of their nature, imagining in their ignorance that the more brutally they executed the deity's will, the more pleasantly would he smile upon them. The Jews killed the Midianites, the Amalekites, the Baalites, and all other peoples they were capable of mastering who despised their god. Later the Mohammedans, with equal mercilessness, followed the example of their Jewish brethren. Later still, the Christians persecuted and murdered many who stubbornly refused to acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ and each nation could not only refer the deed back to the priest from whom the wicked instructions came, but the priest in his turn could point to the passage in his sacred book distinctly commanding or sanctioning such barbarities. The Bible contained instructions for the Jews not only to kill unbelieving people of other nations, but minute details were given as to how believers of their own kith and kin should be put to death. Leviticus 24.16. The Koran was equally explicit in its directions to murder the infidels, chapter on the cow, page 23, and the New Testament, which the Christians accepted as a guide, not only bade the believers have no fellowship with unbelievers, but into whatever city they went, and the people were indisposed to give heed to their preachings, they were to shake off the dust of their feet, and God would make it warmer for such people in the next world than for ordinary sinners. Nay, more. The Christian could point to the strong declaration of Jesus, But those mine enemies who would not say that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay before me. Luke 19.27 The people were told that angels existed. They believed it. They were told that witches were displeasing to the sight of God, that he had given instructions that they were not to be suffered to live. They believed it, and did their best to remove the witches from the face of the earth. They were told that their God liked nothing so much as roast lamb. They believed it. And when they couldn't spare a lamb, they thought it would be pleasant at least for their deity to smell the flavor of it. They were told that God was the father of all men, that he was just and good, but that he liked some nations better than others, and considered some men fit only to be the slaves of others. They believed it. They were told that God made man. They believed it. They were told that he made all other animals for man's pleasure and assistance. 
they believed it. They were told that he made the sun and the stars to give light to the earth. They believed it. They were told that he made the earth. They believed it. That it was flat, and they were flats enough to believe that also. But they were not told who made God. What intelligent mind designed him before he was made? Who made the intelligent mind that designed the God that made the world out of nothing? These matters were allowed to remain impenetrable mysteries. In course of time, morality improved. The would-be murderer found that there were men in the nation who could defend themselves against all assaults of the enemy, and that the only way to be secure from attack was to promise not to be the aggressive party and the thief found that if he stole, others would steal from him, that only by being honest could he hope to have his own property protected. Though very early in the progress of man laws had been made against murder and theft, it was not until men saw that their own life and property were at stake, and that unless they were peaceful and honest themselves, they ran a risk of losing all they had that anything approaching harmony existed among the people of the nations that were on the high road to civilization. Among savage races, murder, theft, and other crimes are almost as rife as ever, and it is only when barbarous races come in contact with races higher up the scale of life that their morality manifests rapid improvement. Skepticism is the sign of a healthy mind. Doubt and unbelief invariably arise as the result of earnest inquiry and vigorous thought. Except among the philosophical Greeks and cultured Romans, doubts concerning the truth of theology were not openly expressed, even by the few, until many centuries after the Christian era began. Of course, among the early Christians there were many who doubted, some who denied the divinity of Jesus many who questioned the truth of the resurrection, among the Brahmins and Buddhists, many who were skeptical on dogmatic points of their faith. But it was not until the middle of the sixteenth century that we find men questioning the pretensions of theologians and exposing with admirable fearlessness and candor the errors of theology. Martin Luther, early in the sixteenth century, boldly questioned the dogmas of the Romish Church, he was ably supported by Philip Melanchthon. But these reformers, although fighting bravely for the right of free thought, were fearful lest others in the exercise of this freedom should go further than they did. Bruno, Telesio, Campanella, and Vanini are among the first mentioned in history who courageously declared their disbelief in the prevailing theology. Bruno was a pantheist. He denied that God was a person and declared that he was an essence. He affirmed that matter was indestructible, that nature produced all phenomena as the fruit of her own womb. He believed in the plurality of worlds and denied the teaching of Aristotle. Telesio and Campanella held much the same belief. Vanini was an atheist. For their heresies, Telesio and Campanella were imprisoned. Bruno and Vanini both died at the stake. No doubt there were many others who entertained doubts similar to those expressed by these noble philosophers. But when they found that their skepticism would be burnt out of them if they expressed it, they doubtlessly came to the conclusion that they had better keep it to themselves until men were more prepared for the reception of it and probably the time would never have come had it not been for the heroism of a Bruno, the defiance of a Vanini, and the persistent teaching of other less-known free-thought worthies. Galileo the astronomer must also be numbered among the skeptics. He denied that the earth was the center of the universe, and in opposition to such teaching declared that it moved round the sun. For making known this now well-established fact, the great astronomer was imprisoned, and a short interval allowed for him to recant or die the death of an infidel. He was an old man, and life was sweet. He elected to live. 
he had sown the seeds of doubt concerning the church's teaching of astronomy. He'd left it to blossom in its own good time. In Europe, periodical efforts had been made to improve the social and domestic life of the people. Feudalism having developed to its highest point, decayed, and upon its ruins were established strong monarchies, which vied with each other in voluptuousness and wickedness. But if the nation showed any signs of going forward in the march of progress, there was always one chain at least to drag them hopelessly back again. This was the Romish church, with its slavish theology and horrible corruption. For centuries the popes at intervals had embroiled Italy. Sometimes several popes ruled at once, and sometimes the Catholic church had no pope at all. To unite and maintain the temporal and spiritual power in their own persons was ever the ruling passion of the Catholic potentates, and for this they have split rivers of human blood. Under their absolute power, the church and its vices has grown up for centuries. Rooted into the heart of society, the people had learnt to revere the ancient institution. Their imaginations were captivated by its showy services. Its priesthood had the keeping of their consciences, was their only means of access to heaven, gave consolation in sickness, married, buried, and sent them to paradise. Its superstitions and centuries of cruelty had as yet only increased its power. Europe was filled with its images of saints and martyrs, real or counterfeit, and the people were instructed to fall down and worship them. Dead saints were made the medium of access to the deity. The services of religion were muttered in dead languages. Priests were decked in dazzling garments. Wax candles burnt in the churches at noonday. Vessels of gold and silver stood on the altars. Preaching had become rare and had degenerated into frivolous talking. Monks who lived a life of ease or idleness, and often of vice, were scattered in multitudes throughout every nation of Christendom, and in order to prevent inquiry and crush opposition, the Inquisition was established and the fire of persecution lit. Pope Alexander the Sixth, a man of unusual depravity, burnt Savonarola for preaching reform in the church. In short, a frightful spiritual despotism, such as Europe had never seen before, held the human mind in abject bondage. Dr. Bollock's History of Modern Europe, page 23. After the Reformation, the disputes between Christians regarding the doctrines of the Protestant as well as the Catholic Church were numerous and exceedingly bitter. But the masses of the people having to work hard for a small pittance and little leisure took comparatively small notice of these theological disputes, and applied themselves with commendable zeal to more useful labor than watching the wretched encounters of fanatical religionists. The printing press, having now got into working order, began to disturb the peace of mind of the clergy and others in authority. Every shot from the armory of intelligence shook to their foundation the dogmas of the church, the people continued to work. Scientific men, too, continued their labors quietly. Columbus discovered America, and frightened credulous believers in the flatness of the earth out of all the wits they ever had. Descartes in France, Spinoza in Holland, formulated a philosophy that knocked the anthropomorphic deity of the Christians quite off its pedestal. It was done, however, in such a learned manner that the common people heard scarcely anything about it. These continued the useful labors of the world. They tilled the soil. They bred cattle. They erected magnificent houses for the rich and small hovels for the poor. They made gaudy raiment wherewith to bedeck the persons of kings and priests and plain dresses as a covering for the common people. Periodically, their progress was thwarted by being called upon to fight religious wars for the priests and wars for the glorification or vanity of kings. Running rapidly over the pages of history, 
one important fact stands prominently out. It is this, that as soon as the nations were at peace, for however short a while, the skeptics appeared again, and with the growing intelligence of the people, spoke in language of unmistakable plainness about religion. Thomas Paine directed his powerful intellect against the upas tree. Voltaire's wit went like a javelin to its core, while Mirabeau and Dolbach tore off the mask and left theology's errors exposed in all their glaring hideousness. And now the dawn of a new era for free thought began to appear. The clergy maligned great skeptics, but skepticism increased notwithstanding. Heretical works were condemned and the authors imprisoned, but the seeds of doubt having been widely sown, nothing short of the wholesale destruction of persons suspected of entertaining these doubts was likely to prove effectual in the extirpation of them. From this point, rapid progress towards the higher civilization was made in all countries in Europe where the people were bold enough to free themselves from the dogmatism of the priests, read the works of scientific men, take advantage of every new discovery, interest themselves in the political and social movements of the country. In short, man advanced in proportion as he devoted himself to the work of the world, and left the next world and all opinions in regard to it to take care of themselves. So far we have seen the progress of man has been won by a vigorous struggling against the harmful forces of nature. In truth, nature has been a very useful servant to those who understand her, but a harsh and brutal master to those who are ignorant of her ways. She is not, nor ever has been, worthy of worship. She destroys every being that lives once, and sometimes by the most painful process it is possible to conceive. How many thousands she has starved with hunger, frozen with cold, poisoned, drowned, or swept away by earthquakes or other frightful calamities, mankind will never know. All we can know is that thousands have been thus sacrificed, and that in proportion as man used one force of nature to counteract the effects of another, he has advanced. When the skeptical man had a chance of life, his advance toward civilization was rapid. The skeptical mind investigated. New discoveries were made. The printing press increased in usefulness and power. New forms of industry were started, and a higher happiness made possible for the masses of the people. The art of agriculture steadily improved and the shipping of merchandise from one nation to another was greatly facilitated by improved skill in navigation. Great, however, as were the strides toward civilization in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, they were all eclipsed in the early part of the nineteenth century by the utilization of steam power, electricity, and other great natural forces, which had the effect of greatly increasing the wealth-producing power of those nations that adopted them. Nor was this all, for immediately following, machinery, which saved an enormous amount of labor, was introduced. Food and clothing became cheaper, the people multiplied rapidly, and with this increase of population grew a proportionate demand for food and labor. In a short time the struggle for existence was manifestly keener than it had ever been before. The rich became richer and richer, while among the poor the tendency was to get poorer and more poor. Uncomplainingly the people devoted themselves to the labor of each day. Theology they set aside for six days of the week, and concerned themselves about the gods on Sunday. Though they did not often say so, the majority of men thought it was far better for them to be diligent workmen, performing all the secular duties of daily life, building houses, making clothes, machinery, writing books, acting the part of good husbands, fathers, or citizens, than to have the most orthodox belief it was possible for a being to entertain. And this sentiment grew stronger and stronger, and proved of immense importance to mankind. For hundreds of years, 
theologians had talked about the importance of saving men's souls, and those who possessed the smallest seemed to make the most fuss about them. But now the aspect of things was changed. Men began to talk about looking after their bodies, and some ventured to suggest that if they had souls in their bodies it would, perhaps, be no disadvantage to them if their bodies were well fed, well clothed, and their whole being well trained. Necessity forced all but a small minority into the labor market, and after years of labor the earth was converted from a howling wilderness into a home fit for habitation. Here let me distinctly affirm that all that is admirable in civilized life, the comfort of home, the pleasure of education, the fascination of the drama, the beauty of painting or sculpture, the usefulness of scientific acquirements, owe their value to the secular labor of mankind. Theology deserves no credit in respect to these things. Theology did not help man to supersede the sailing vessel by the steamship, the old coach by the railroad, the reaping machine by the scythe, vice versa, D.W., nor the fastest locomotion by the telegraph wires. The theologian did not discover the telephone, nor did he learn how to light, with a brilliancy previously unknown to man, our streets and great public buildings by means of electricity. One Stevenson is worth a thousand theologians. One Edison of more value to the world than all the gods that men's imagination have ever pictured. But see what additional wonders the secular laborer has accomplished. He has removed forests of trees and converted them into houses. The hides of cattle he turned into boots and shoes the wool of sheep he has transformed into robes of beauty and utility. He has bedecked our walls with paintings, put books upon our shelves, and with sweet music gladdened our hearts. To accomplish all this he has had to rely solely upon his reason. Yet theologians call this splendid attribute carnal reason, and declare that it is no safe guide to man. It has been man's only guide, and when he has trusted it, he has been more often in the right than otherwise. Even his errors have assisted him in future labors. Faith he has had, but it has always been secular faith. Experience has been his guide, science a lamp unto his feet. Even when he has walked down the wrong path, he has done so with his eyes open. Theological faith is sightless. It allures you to the brink of a precipice and precipitates you to the earth beneath. It is a ship without a rudder. The tempestuous waves toss it about recklessly. The wind drives it savagely against the rocks, and today this ship called theological faith is a dreary wreck. But reason grows stronger and clearer as the ages roll on. Man has discovered that he can trust it that he can use it, that he can assist himself and others by the employment of it. In other words, he can do his own thinking, reason out his own principles, act his own life. He can be a man, and it is better for an individual to be a bad original than a good copy of somebody else. Man is civilized today. He has fought a good fight, he has conquered a foe, but better than all, he has converted an enemy into a friend. What is man's future policy? Is there not still plenty of labor for him to perform? Is there not an ocean of enigmas yet to be fathomed, a gold mine of knowledge yet to be explored? Is there not poverty to be remedied, pain to be alleviated, ignorance to be removed? The reformer has yet something to inspire his fervid soul the philanthropist plenty to touch his generous heart. Why, even now the wealthy rogue struts pompously upon the stage of life in grand attire and flares sumptuously every day, while honest poverty in rags lies hungry and fainting at his door. Even now the rich own all the land, and many poor have not where to lay their head. 
Even now all men are not equal in the sight of the law, and one man gets pensioned for work for which another is incarcerated in jail. Even now our sisters are outraged and turned adrift upon the world to be the playthings of vicious men forevermore. Even now our workhouses are filled with men and women who are able to work for an honest living, if they could get it, but cannot because labor is cheap and there are too many waiting to perform it. Even now our jails are filled with society-made criminals, that education and better circumstances might have rescued from a life of misery and crime. Even now youth is stunted and starved, and men and women pine away, racked with some terrible disease which thoughtless and careless parents have transmitted to them. Reformers abate not your enthusiasm, but work bravely on. Through the world diffuse the glorious light of knowledge. Let men learn that all crime is a mistake, that effects always follow causes, and that a good effect never follows from a bad cause in a nation that is governed on the principles of truth and justice. Remove poverty by sound advice to the poor and by strenuous efforts to improve men's surroundings. Stay the drunkard in his downward course and assist unceasingly all social and political progress. Popularity you may never attain. Even praise for your unselfish labor may be denied you while you live. But good work must leave its influence in the world, and your children's children will assuredly profit by it. For, as Carlyle truly says, beautiful it is to see and understand that no worth, or known or unknown, can die even on this earth. The work an unknown good man has done is like a hidden vein of water flowing underground, secretly making the ground green. It flows and flows. It joins itself with other veins and veinlets, and one day it will start forth as a visible perennial well. End of Natural Man by Arthur B. Moss Recording by Roger Moline Peter Lombard and the Sacramental System Excerpt by Elizabeth Frances Rogers, 1892-1974 Published in 1917 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6. Peter Lombard and His Textbook Introduction Manuals which gather knowledge or opinion and present it in orderly form often live longer and sometimes seem to exert an influence far exceeding the works of original genius. Donatus wrote in his Ars Grammatica the rules of composition devised by many, which he alone collected and ordered for common instruction. He had deserved fame as a teacher, to whom Jerome went as a pupil, but the Ars Grammatica became the school book of the Middle Ages, was still in use at the Reformation, while its author's name became a common metonymy in the form donut for a rudimentary treatise of any sort still greater has been the vogue of euclid who in the third century before the christian era produced his elements which in varied forms are still books of instruction for youth in the science of geometry similar to the role played by these two is that of the greatest theological textbook of the middle ages to whose author we have at last come. The Life of Peter Lombard Peter Lombard, the master of the sentences, was born in Lumello, not far from the Novara, which then belonged to Lombardy, probably about 1100. His family, both poor and obscure, was unable to educate the son, 
and there was small hope for a career in the church until he found a patron in the bishop of lucca who sent him to school at bologna the success in his studies achieved there made him wish to go to france and in this desire again his patron helped him with a letter of recommendation to saint bernard abbot of clairvaux bernard at first placed him in the episcopal school at rheims which then enjoyed a great reputation under the headship of le Tauf, where he remained but a short time paris was really the centre of the intellectual movement of the day and it is therefore not surprising that peter wished to go thither bernard who had provided for his needs at rheims now wrote recommending him to gildun abbot of st victor for the short stay which he intended to make in paris the school of st victor was at that time famous for its learning it was to this abbey that william of campo had retired in eleven hundred and eight and with him had come many of his pupils william was made bishop of chalons in eleven thirteen but his successor gilduin elected abbot the following year maintained the tradition of piety and learning and to the school came students from all over europe of whom perhaps the most famous was hugh of blankenberg better known as hugh of st victor the lombard probably came to paris before eleven thirty nine just as abelard had resumed his career as a teacher there probably peter lombard heard his lectures at least he read his books for john of cornwall tells us that he frequently had his book in his hands he also studied gratian's decretum which had just been finished and it was precisely these two influences abelard and gratian which most conditioned his later method of exposition he soon gained the chair of theology at the cathedral school of notre dame which he filled for many years and in which he won great and enduring repute by eleven forty two his commentary on the epistles of st paul had become known in eleven forty eight he was at rheims with robert of moulin and joined adam du petit pont and hugh of reading as opponents of gilbert de la Porre in theological discussions he is already well enough known to be consulted by pope eugenie the third and no greater evidence of the regard in which he was now held could be found some time during the years eleven forty eight eleven fifty he was at rome probably on account of the troubles arising in the paris schools while there he became acquainted with the work of john of damascus the fountain of knowledge which had just been translated by burgundio of pisa this again shows us his interest in the latest publications his own fertility of mind was matched with a desire to know the thoughts of others at the beginning of eleven fifty two when his successful teaching at paris had made his reputation and when his libre sententiarum had just been finished a bull of eugene the third gave him a prebend in the diocese of Beauvoir again on the recommendation of bernard of clairvaux his teaching had been opposed in some points by robert of maloon and maurice of sully but peter endeavored always to keep it orthodox though taking account of all the opinions of the day he was always circumspect always deferential to authority and a friend of peace his instruction despite this opposition was successful and his pupils realizing the merit of his lectures begged him to publish them to this request we owe the celebrated book of sentences in eleven fifty nine the bishopric of paris was vacant by the death of thilbault philip of france fourth brother of king louis the seventh and archdeacon of paris was elected to succeed him he declined but advised the canons to elect peter lombard whose pupil he had been and whose talents and services fitted him for this dignity later in the century 
Walter of St. Victor accused him of gaining the election by simony, but there seems to have been no just ground for this accusation. In July 1160, Peter was succeeded in the bishopric by Maurice de Soli, a master in theology and the builder of the present Cathedral of Notre Dame. Peter died some time after. The date is not known but it cannot have been later than 1164. In the Cartulary of Paris, we find his name mentioned a couple of times. The house in which he had lived was given to the Church of Paris, and Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury, presented the original manuscript of the sentences to the Cathedral Library for the benefit of poor students it is most surprising that a man whose book has been so widely known should be mentioned so seldom by contemporary historians the lombard's earlier works from the earlier period of peter lombard's life three works have come down to us the commentary on the psalms of david and the commentary on the epistles of saint paul and his sermons for the study of the scriptures the middle ages had a number of collections of the comments of the fathers on the several books of the bible in the lombard's time the most celebrated was that of Wilfrid strabo known as the glossa ordinaria written in the ninth century at the beginning of the twelfth century anselm of leon added new notes to this between the lines and his work was known as the glossa interlinearis peter lombard simply used this glossa and composed his commentary almost entirely of citations from augustine cassiodorus the glossa of Alsuin, rabanus morris and others which were included in the glossa following their example he does not entirely give up the literal sense of the passage but always inclines rather to the spiritual and mystical interpretation his commentary on st paul's epistles was written about eleven forty like that on the psalms it is hardly more than a compilation of extracts from the writings of ambrose hilary jerome augustine cassiodorus and remy of auxerre the lombard's sermons are hard to date some are probably from the time of his episcopate others certainly seem to be from the period of his residence with the canons of st victor their pulpit was famous and peter must have preached there the sermons are still unpublished some of the sermons are said to be inferior in style to that of the books of the sentences and would therefore lead us to believe that they were from an earlier period some also show quite strikingly the influence of the strong mysticism of saint victor the four books of sentences the book on which peter lombard's fame rests and from which he gained his title of master of sentences was a libri quator sententiarum this was probably written about 1150. This date seems to fit with the few facts that we know about his life and with his use of Gratian's Decretum and John of Damascus's Fountain of Knowledge, which Peter himself tells us had been translated by order of Pope Eugene the Third from the Greek into Latin in the prologue to the sentences peter lombard declares that he has gathered the opinions of the fathers into one volume that the students may be saved the handling of a number of books he makes no pretense to originality the middle age was a period of codification in all branches of knowledge and the lombard follows a long line of canonists and theologians who had devoted themselves to gathering and codifying the opinions of the fathers and doctors of the church on question of doctrine in the first half of the twelfth century this parallel development of canon law and theology was summed up in two great textbooks gratian's decretum 
or Concordia Discordantium Canonum, and Peter Lombard's Libre Quartor Sententiarum. The legend that made Peter and Gratian brothers is untrue, but it is at least an interesting exposition of the comparison that the Middle Ages always drew between their two books. Up to the twelfth century there had been no textbook for the study of theology. It is certainly interesting then to see how the Lombard systematized the theological teaching of the Middle Ages into a compendium which became the basis of the instruction in the schools and universities for centuries and the starting point for the work of all Catholic theologians. In this task, Peter Lombard owed much to the work of his predecessors, and especially to the books of his contemporaries, which appeared a few years before his own. There are only about ten lines in the whole book, for which no source can be found. Abelard had already led the way in the systematizing of theology by his Theologia, and we can see the widespread influence of this in several books, the sentences of peter abelard or the epitome as it is usually erroneously called a collection of abelard's opinions made by some of his pupils the sentences of roland bardinelli later pope alexander the second of omnibini and most important of all those of peter lombard for his method the Lombard was more dependent on the model of Abelard's Sic et Non, the gathering of authorities in a systematic, methodical way, for and against a doctrine. But unlike Abelard, he makes some attempt at reconciling the differences between his authorities by subtle distinctions and clever inferences. Peter states the proposition quotes the authorities on the subject, which are often quite contradictory, and ends with a few words which show the true conclusion as he sees it. He is always timid, always modest, and some of his conclusions are intentionally stated quite vaguely. His humility and modesty are summed up admirably in the rather discouraged words at the end of one distinction. If anyone can explain this better, I am not envious. In the arrangement of his book, he does not follow Abelard's Theologia that was divided under the headings Faith, Charity, and Sacrament. Peter Lombard's division into four books was perhaps taken from John of Damascus's Fountain of Knowledge, which he followed quite closely in the first three books. In the prologue, he says that he will divide the books into chapters with titles, what is sought may be found more easily. In this arrangement, he was influenced by the decretum. Later, in the next century, it was divided into distinctions. The patristic authorities which the Lombard cites in defense of every point in his arguments he found mostly in the Sic et Non and in Gratian's Decretum. It is probable that the gathering of many of the quotations from the fathers in the Sic et Non was the fruit of Abelard's own reading, but certainly there were others in that period who were working at the same task. Alger of Liege had also put together texts from patristic writings in his sentences which were an aid to Peter Lombard's work, and some of which were incorporated in Gratian's Decretum. The frequently repeated phrase, we are often asked, shows that Peter was considering all the questions and opinions of his age on the points in question and attempting to harmonize them. On the whole, he succeeds in remaining rigorously orthodox, but there was opposition to some of his views during his lifetime and after the third council of the lateran in 1179 however began one canon with we believe with peter abelard 
in the thirteenth century the masters of paris condemned several propositions which have since been published at the end of the book the lombard's rather vaguely stated conclusions were an advantage to the book when used as a text in the schools for it encouraged questions and comments on it by both masters and students the first book of the sentences discusses the trinity the second the creation and the fall the third the incarnation and the last the sacraments and eschatology it is of course his discussion of sacraments which here concern us here much work had already been done by the theologians of the period and peter entered into their labors in his sentences robert pullus the first english cardinal had given four of his eight books to a discussion of the sacraments but his work was not systematically arranged and a very slight comparison with peter's shows what an advance the latter had made his advance however was only possible by the help of the cardinal's work in the theologia of abelard as in the books of sentences by his followers the sacraments had been discussed at length in the sic et non too questions relating to the sacraments had been raised and both these had a marked influence on peter's fourth book hugh of st victor's last work before his death in eleven forty one was de sacramentis fidei much of this had been taken over word for word by the summa sententiarum which quite certainly was not by hugh but comes from his school originally it had no tractates on the last things on orders or on marriage the tractate on orders was taken from ivo of chartres that on marriage from walter of martigues but these had been added to the other tractates before the lombard study of the books for he made use of them both fournier has made it certain that gratian's decretum was written before peter lombard's sentences and it is then quite clear that it was one of the sources for peter's discussion of the sacraments from the decretum and from abelard's secat non peter took the citations from patristic literature as authorities for his argument the lombard transcribes literally passages from hugh's de sacramentis or from the summa and adds citations of authorities which he took from gratian today such methods would lay him open immediately to the charge of plagiarism but in the middle ages this was a correct literary method passages from the fathers are given under their own names at least to the best of his knowledge of them but those from works of his contemporaries quite anonymously end of peter lombard and the sacramental system excerpt by elizabeth francis rogers eighteen ninety two to nineteen seventy four published in nineteen seventeen sentences book four by peter lombard excerpts translated by elizabeth francis rogers eighteen ninety two to nineteen seventy four published in nineteen seventeen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org beginning on page seventy eight note on the translation distinctions one through twenty six earlier chapters of the fourth book of peter lombard's sentences which deals with the sacraments has been translated from the latin in the hope that they may be of use to some readers my work has been painstakingly criticized and corrected by dr louise r loomis but i only am responsible for its errors especially in the few passages where i venture to disagree with her 
poententia has been translated penance throughout in accordance with roman catholic usage res presented much more serious difficulties in the end it was translated in nearly every case thing and it has been left to the reader to learn the content of the latin word other translations were suited to only a few uses of the word or else seemed to interfere with accepted philosophic terms the only other alternative was to leave it untranslated as harnack does in his history of dogma the biblical references and quotations are according to the douay version which in some cases differs from the king james version translation of book four distinctions one through twenty six of the quartar libre sententiarum of peter the lombard distinction one part one one of sacraments the samaritan who tended the wounded man applied for his relief the dressings of the sacraments just as god instituted the remedies of the sacraments against the wounds of original and actual sin footnote luke ten verse thirty end footnote concerning the sacraments four questions first present themselves for consideration what a sacrament is why it was instituted wherein it consists and how it is performed and what the difference is between the sacraments of the old and the new covenants two what a sacrament is Quote, a sacrament is the sign of a sacred thing parenthesis res footnote see augustine ten de civ d c five and two contra adversar legat et prof c nine n thirty four and footnote however a sacred mystery is also called a sacrament as the sacrament of divinity so that a sacrament may be the sign of something sacred and the sacred thing signified but now we are considering a sacrament as a sign so quote, a sacrament is the visible form of an invisible grace End quote. footnote berengar de sacra coena see augustine three question in pentateuch q eighty four and footnote three what a sign is quote, but a sign is the thing parenthesis res behind the form which it wears to the senses which brings by means of itself something else to our minds footnote see augustine two de doctor christ c one n one End footnote. Four, how a sign and a sacrament differ. Furthermore, some signs are natural, as smoke, which signifies fire; others conventional, and of those which are conventional, some are sacraments, some not. For every sacrament is a sign, but the converse is not true the sacrament bears a resemblance to the thing of which it is a sign for if sacraments did not bear a resemblance to the thing of which they are the sacraments they could not properly be called sacraments for a sacrament is properly so called because it is a sign of the grace of god and the expression of invisible grace so that it bears its image and is its cause sacraments therefore were not instituted merely in order to signify something but also as a means of sanctification for things which were instituted only to signify are signs only and not sacraments such as the sacrifices of flesh and the ceremonial observances of the old law which could never justify those who offered them because as the apostle says the blood of goats and of oxen and the ashes of an heifer being sprinkled and sanctify such as are defiled to the cleansing of the flesh but not of the spirit see hebrews nine thirteen now this uncleanliness was the touching of a dead body 
wherefore augustine by that defilement which the law cleanses i understand merely the touching of a dead body since any one who had touched one was unclean seven days but he was purified according to the law on the third day and on the seventh and was cleansed so that he might enter the temple the legal observances also cleansed sometimes from bodily leprosy but no one was ever justified by the works of the law as says the apostle even if he performed them in faith and charity see romans three twenty galatians two sixteen see also romans five fourteen quote, adam who is a figure of him who was to come End quote. End footnote. why because god has ordained them unto servitude not unto justification so that they might be types of something to come wishing that these offerings should be made to him rather than to idols they therefore were signs yet also sacraments although they are often called so incorrectly in the scriptures because they were rather signs of a sacred thing than availing anything themselves these moreover the apostle calls works of the law which were instituted only to signify something or as a yoke see romans three twenty galatians two sixteen acts fifteen ten five why the sacraments were instituted the sacraments were instituted for a threefold reason for humility instruction and exercise for humility so that while man by order of the creator abases himself in worship before insensible things which by nature are beneath him through his humility and obedience he may become more pleasing to god and more meritorious in his sight at whose command he seeks salvation in things beneath him yet not from them but through them from god for instruction also were the sacraments instituted so that the mind might be taught by what it sees outside in visible form to recognize the invisible virtue which is within for man who before sin saw god without a mediator through sin has become so dulled that he is in no wise able to comprehend divine things unless trained thereto by human things likewise the sacraments were instituted for exercise because since man cannot be idle there is offered him in the sacraments a useful and safe exercise by which he may avoid vain and harmful occupation for he who devotes himself to good exercise is not easily caught by the tempter wherefore jerome warns us quote, always do some sort of work that the devil may find you occupied End quote. Quote, there are moreover three kinds of exercises one aims at the edification of the soul another aims at the nourishment of the body another at the destruction of both End quote. and inasmuch as without a sacrament to which god has not limited his power he could not give grace to man he has for the aforesaid reasons instituted the sacraments quote, these are two parts of which a sacrament consists namely words and things words as the invocation of the trinity things as water oil and the like page ninety one distinction three part two five of the institution of baptism as for the institution of baptism when it began there are various opinions some say baptism was instituted when christ told nicodemus unless a man be born again of water and of the holy spirit see john three five c f hugh of st victor two de sacraments page six c four others say baptism was instituted when he said to the apostles go ye teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit 
see matthew twenty eight nineteen but this he said to them after the resurrection in his instructions for the calling of the gentiles while before his passion he had sent them two by two to preach in judea and to baptize with the words go not aside unto the ways of the gentiles see matthew ten verse five at that time therefore was baptism instituted because they then both preached and baptized if now we are asked under what form the apostles then baptized we can surely reply in the name of the trinity that is under the form which they baptized the gentiles afterwards for we can understand that it was given them before the passion although it is not so recorded christ did not therefore first give them this form when he sent them to evangelize the gentiles but rather the form which he had given before when he sent them into judea he afterward repeated when he sent them to the gentiles accordingly it is more fitting to say that the institution was established when christ was baptized by john in the jordan which he arranged not because he wished to be cleansed since he was without sin but because by the contact of his pure flesh he bestowed regenerating power on the waters so that whosoever was afterwards immersed with the invocation of the name of the trinity might be cleansed from sin at that time therefore the baptism of christ was instituted by which the trinity whose mystery therein was made known baptizes a man within page ninety five distinction four part one one of those who received the sacrament and the thing parenthesis res and the thing and not the sacrament and the sacrament and not the thing here we must say that some received the sacrament and the thing some the sacrament and not the thing some the thing and not the sacrament all infants receive the sacrament and the thing at the same time who are cleansed in baptism from original sin although some deny that sins are forgiven to children who are about to die and support this opinion by the word of augustine sacraments accomplish what they symbolize in the elect only they do not understand that this must be interpreted that while the sacraments accomplish remission in others they do not do it for them unto salvation but only for the elect for that in baptism sin is remitted to all infants augustine clearly says quote, from the newborn infant to the decrepit old man just as no one is debarred from baptism so there is no one who does not die to sin in baptism but infants to original sin only adults however to all sins which they have added to original sin by evil living End quote. unless the enormity of their life prevents some also who are baptized with faith receive the sacrament and the thing now to page one hundred and twelve distinction six three that no one may be baptized in his mother's womb we must also understand quote, that although immersion is performed three times on account of the mystery of the trinity yet it is counted only one baptism End quote. jerome two commentary on epistle ad ephesians four five c iodum modo eight one we are also not to be ignorant that no one can be baptized in his mother's womb even if the mother be baptized wherefore isidore quote, those who are in their mother's wombs cannot be baptized because he who is not yet born according to adam cannot be born again according to christ nor can we speak of the rebirth of one whose birth has not preceded it also augustine no one can be born again before he is born 
but if jeremiah and john the baptist be cited against this opinion because they were said to be sanctified from the womb as also some think was true of jacob we say that if they there received sanctification as inward cleansing it must be held among the miracles of divine power as augustine says speaking ambiguously about this if he says the use of reason and will was so far advanced in that boy that within the mother's womb he could already know and believe a thing that only age makes possible in other children it must be held among the miracles of divine power not taken as typical of human nature for when god willed it even an ass spoke also concerning jeremiah it is said before thou camest out of the womb i sanctified thee but that sanctification by which we are made the temple of god is only for the reborn for unless a man be born again of water and of the holy spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of god no one is born again unless he is already born wherefore this sanctification can be received according to predestination here he seems to speak doubtfully when he says it is not said that the infant believed in the womb but that he leaped nor did elizabeth say he leaped in faith but he leaped in the womb and this sanctification could be the sign of greatness recognized by the older person but not comprehended by the child he speaks without assertion of this sanctification not defining just how the sanctification is to be understood whether it be the sign of something to come or the truth of the justification accomplished by the spirit but it is better that we say that these two jeremiah and john were justified in the womb contrary to the common law and aided by grace all sins were forgiven them this is also taught by many testimonies of the saints page one twenty two distinction seven six of the sacrament and the thing parenthesis res now let us see what is the sacrament and what the thing parenthesis res Quote, the sacrament is the visible form of invisible grace the form therefore of the bread and wine which appears here is the sacrament that is the sign of a sacred thing because it calls something to mind beyond the appearance which it presents to the senses therefore the appearances keep the names of the things which they were before namely bread and wine seven that the thing res in parenthesis of this sacrament is twofold moreover the thing res of this sacrament is twofold one what it contained and signified the other is what it signified but not contained the thing contained and signified is the flesh of christ which he received from the virgin and the blood which he shed for us the thing signified and not contained is the unity of the church in those who are predestined called justified and glorified see first corinthians eleven twenty three this is the twofold flesh and blood of christ wherefore jerome quote, in two ways says he are the flesh of christ and his blood understood either the flesh which was crucified and buried and the blood which was shed by the lance of the soldier or that spiritual and divine body of which he himself says my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed and unless ye eat my flesh and drink my blood ye have not life in you see john six fifty six and fifty four therefore three things are to be distinguished here the first which is the sacrament only the second which is the sacrament and the thing 
quotations res and the third which is the thing and not the sacrament the sacrament and not the thing is the visible form of bread and wine the sacrament and the thing is the very flesh and blood of christ the thing and not the sacrament is his mystical flesh furthermore that visible form is the sacrament of something twofold because it signifies two things and bears the express likeness of two things for just as bread more than any other food restores and sustains the body and wine gladdens and inebriates man so the flesh of christ spiritually restores and sustains the inward man more than any other graces wherefore my chalice which inebriateth me how good it is see psalm twenty two verse five the visible form bears also a resemblance to a mystical thing which is the unity of the faithful because just as one loaf is made from many grains and wine from many grapes flow together so ecclesiastical unity is composed of the many persons of the faithful wherefore the apostle we being many are one bread and one body see first corinthians ten seventeen wherefore augustine the church is called one bread and one body because just as one loaf is composed of many grains and one body of many members so the church of many faithful is bound together by uniting charity this mystery is our peace and unity christ consecrated at his table he who receives this mystery of unity and does not keep the bond of peace receives this mystery not for himself but against himself and of this unity also christ's own body received from the virgin is the sacrament because as the body of christ was composed of many very pure and immaculate members so the society of the church is composed of many persons freed from the stain of sin as a type of this unity the ark of the lord was made of sedum wood which does not decay but is like white thorn see exodus twenty five ten page one hundred and thirty four distinction eleven part one one of the manner of conversion but if any one asks what the nature of that conversion is whether of form or of substance or of some other part i am not able to define i know however that it is not of form because the appearances of the things remain what they were before and the taste and weight to some it seems to be a change of substance for they say that the substance is so converted into substance that the latter becomes the former in essence with this opinion the foregoing authorities seem to agree but others make the following objections to this opinion if the substance of bread they say or of wine be converted into substance into the body or blood of christ a substance is daily made the body or blood of christ which previously was not and to-day there is a body of christ which yesterday was not and daily the body of christ is increased and formed of material of which at its conception it was not made to these we can reply as follows that the body of christ is not said to be made by the divine words in the sense that the very body formed when the virgin conceived is formed again but that the substance of bread or wine which formerly was not the body or blood of christ is by the divine words made this body and blood and therefore priests are said to make the body and blood of christ because by their ministry the substance of bread is made the flesh and the substance of wine is made the blood of christ yet nothing is added to his body or blood nor is the body or blood of christ increased page one hundred and fifty one distinction fourteen 
part one one of penance and why it is called penance next we must discuss penance penance is needful to those who are far from god that they may come near for it is as jerome says the second plank after shipwreck because if any one by sinning sullies the robe of innocence received in baptism he can restore it by the remedy of penance the first plank is baptism whereas the old man is laid aside and the new put on the second penance by which after a fall we rise again while the old state which had returned is disdained and the new one which had been lost is resumed those who have lapsed after baptism can be restored by penance but not by baptism a man is allowed to do penance often but not to be baptized often baptism is called only a sacrament but penance is called both a sacrament and virtue of the mind for there is an inner penance and an outer the outer is the sacrament the inner is the virtue of the mind and both are for the sake of salvation and justification but whether all outer penance is a sacrament or if not all what is to be classed under this name we shall investigate later with penance began the preaching of john who said do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and what the herald taught the truth afterwards preached beginning his discourse with penance see matthew three two and also matthew four seventeen page one hundred and sixty five distinction fifteen five what alms are for alms are a work of mercy as is most truly said have pity on thy own soul pleasing god they do not therefore deceive themselves who think that by abundant alms of their fruits or of their riches they buy themselves impunity and continue in their sins for they so love that they desire to remain in them but he who loves iniquity hateth his own soul and whoever hates his own soul is not merciful to it but cruel certainly by loving it according to the world he hates it according to god if therefore he wishes to give it alms through which it may be made clean let him hate it according to the world and love it according to god by the alms which a man owes first of all to himself the inner man is cleansed christ exhorts us to this and says make clean the things that are within for nothing is clean to the unclean but their minds and consciences are polluted as the apostle says but all are unclean whom faith does not cleanse by which we believe on christ and of this it is written cleansing their hearts by faith but lest it seem that christ rejects the alms which are offered of the fruits of the earth those he says ought to have been done that is judgment and love of god and the others not omitted that is alms of earthly fruits page one hundred and seventy seven distinction seventeen part one one whether sins are forgiven without confession here arises a question that has many parts for first we are asked whether without satisfaction and confession of the mouth by contrition of the heart only sin may be forgiven any one secondly whether it suffices for any one to confess to god without a priest thirdly whether confession made to a faithful layman would be valid on these points even the learned are found to think differently because the doctors seem to have taught varied and almost contradictory views about them for some say that without confession of the mouth and satisfaction of deed no one is cleansed from sin if he has time for doing these things 
but others say that before confession of the mouth and satisfaction through the contrition of the heart sin is forgiven by god if however the sinner has the desire to confess wherefore the prophet i have said i will confess against myself my injustices to the lord and thou hast remitted etc see psalm thirty one verse five which cassiodorus explained saying i have said that is i have determined within myself that i would confess and thou hast remitted it great pity of god who hast remitted the sin for the mere promise for the promise is accepted for the deed also augustine not yet does he make it known but he promises that he will make it known and the lord remits it because to say just this is to make something known in the heart not yet is a voice in the mouth but that a man may hear the confession and god hears also the sacrifice of god is a troubled spirit a contrite heart etc elsewhere we also read that whatever hour a sinner turns and laments he shall live in life and shall not die it does not say he confesses with his mouth but turns laments wherefore we are given to understand that even though the mouth be silent we may sometimes obtain pardon hence the lepers also whom the lord commanded to show themselves to the priests were cleansed on the way before they reached the priests by this it is indicated that before we open our mouths to the priests that is confess our sins we are cleansed from the leprosy of sin lazarus was also not first led out of the tomb and afterward awakened by the lord but was awakened within and came forth alive that the awakening of the spirit might be shown to precede confession for no one can confess unless aroused because confession by one dead as by one who is not does not exist therefore no one confesses unless aroused but no one is aroused except he who is absolved from sin because sin is the death of the soul and as the soul is the life of the body so its own life is god from these and many other authorities it is proved that before confession or satisfaction sin is forgiven upon contrition alone and those who deny it find it hard to explain these authorities and they introduce the testimony of other authorities for the overthrow of this opinion and the support of their own for the lord says through isaiah tell thou thy iniquities that thou mayest be justified see isaiah forty three twenty six also ambrose no man can be justified from sin unless he has first confessed the sin itself he also says confession frees the soul from death confession opens paradise confession gives the hope of salvation because he does not deserve to be justified who is not willing to confess his sin in this lifetime confession frees us which is done with penance but penance is the grief of the heart and the bitterness of the soul for the evils which each one has committed also john no one can receive the grace of god unless he has been purified of all sin by the confession of penance and by baptism footnote chromotatius question mark c non posti quis forty one ibit End footnote also augustine do penance as it is done in the church let no one say to himself i do it secretly because i do it before god god knows who has pardoned me because i do it in my heart then without cause was it said what thou loosest on earth shall be loosed in heaven then without cause were the keys given then we make vain the word of christ job says 
if i have blushed to confess my sins in the sight of the people also ambrose the guilt is venial which is followed by confession of sins also augustine on this passage of the psalm let not the deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me says the pit is the deep of iniquity into which if thou hast fallen its mouth shall not close upon thee if thou dost not close thy mouth confess therefore and say out of the depths have i cried unto thee o lord etc and thou shalt escape it closes upon him who has despised it in the depth from whom in death just as from one who is not there can be no confession also no one receives pardon for a more grievous debt of penalty unless he has paid some kind of penalty even if much less than he owes for so the liberality of mercy is granted us by god that the justice of discipline be not neglected also jerome let him who is a sinner lament his own sins or those of the people and let him enter the church from which he had wandered on account of sin and let him sleep in sackcloth that he may compensate by austerity of life for the earlier pleasures by which he offended god by these and other authorities they endeavor to prove that without oral confession and some payment of penalty no one can be cleansed from sin what therefore is to be thought about these things what believed it can certainly be said that without confession of the mouth and payment of the outward penalty sins are effaced by contrition and humility of heart for from the moment any one proposes to confess being pricked in conscience god forgives because there is there the confession of the heart though not of the mouth by which the soul is cleansed within from the stain and contagion of committed sin and the debt of eternal death is relaxed therefore that which was said above regarding confession and penance should be referred either to the confession of the heart or to inward punishment just as this saying of augustine that no one obtains pardon unless first he has paid some small penalty for his sin must be understood of the external penalty and applied to the scornful or negligent just as this let no one say i do it secretly etc for some neglect to confess sins in their lifetime and are ashamed to do it and therefore do not deserve to be justified for just as inward penance is enjoined upon us so also confession of the mouth and outward satisfaction if we have the opportunity wherefore he is not truly penitent who does not have the desire to confess and just as remission of sin is the gift of god so penance and confession by which sin is wiped out cannot take place save from god as augustine says now he says he has the gift of the holy spirit who confesses and repents because there cannot be confession of sin and compunction in man of himself for when any one is angry at himself and dissatisfied with himself it is not without the gift of the holy spirit therefore a penitent ought to confess his sins if he have time and yet before confession of the mouth if there is the promise in the heart forgiveness is extended to him end of the sentences of peter lombard book four sacraments excerpts translated by elizabeth francis rogers eighteen ninety two to nineteen seventy four published in nineteen seventeen the silent city of the muir glacier by david stark jordan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. Richard G. Willoughby is a mining prospector and promoter resident in Juneau, Alaska, a man whose vocation enables him to see some wonderful things. In June 1888, according to his statement, Mr. Willoughby beheld an extraordinary mirage from the surface of the Muir Glacier. It was the apparition of a great city of tall houses of brick and stone, plainly shown in the air under the influence of some powerful refraction. Behind the city was a river in which shipping was faintly shown. In the foreground, the leafless branches of tall elm trees were clearly traceable. In the center of the city was a large edifice with several towers, and on some of these towers the presence of scaffolding showed that building was still going on. This mirage was seen by him several times from year to year, and on the unfinished building the stages in the process of erection each season could be distinctly followed. Mr. Willoughby sent to San Francisco and secured a camera with a number of highly sensitized plates of the usual commercial sort in order to photograph the apparition. This he succeeded in doing, but once successfully. The necessary exposure was a very long one, because of the unsubstantiality of the object. The one negative, however, gave a fairly clear print. Copies were at once made, and R. G. Willoughby's Silent City, 75 cents each, was added to the wonders of Alaska. I present herewith a copy of this picture, bought by me in Sitka in 1896. The picture is not quite the same as the original edition of 1888. The scene is exactly identical, but the card has been reduced in size by the omission of superfluous sky. It has been rendered much fainter and more ghost-like than the original, and is perhaps taken from a new negative, in which the lines of the houses and gravel walks have been purposely made less distinct. The original edition has the following on the back of the card. The Glacial Wonder of the Silent City For the past fifteen years, Professor Richard Willoughby has been a character in Alaska, as well known among the whites as he has been familiar to the natives. As one of the early settlers of Old Fort Wrangell, in which his individuality was stamped among the sturdy miners who frequented the then important trading port of Alaska, he has grown with the territory, and is today as much a part of its history as the totem poles are identified with the deeds of valor or commemorative of the past triumphs of prominent members of the tribes which their hideous and mysterious characters represent to him belongs the honor of being the first american who discovered gold within alaska's icy bound peaks but his greatest achievement from a scientific standpoint is his tearing from the glacier's chilly bosom the mirages of cities from distant climes after four years of labor amid dangers privations and sufferings he accomplished for the civilized world a feat in photography heretofore considered problematic it was on the longest day of june 1888 that the camera took within its grasp the reproduction of a city remote if indeed not altogether within the recesses of another world the silent city is here presented for the consideration of the public as the wonder and pride of alaska's bleak hills and the ever-changing glaciers may never again afford a like opportunity for the accomplishment of this sublime phenomena the picture attracted much attention and met with an encouraging sale the skeptical bought it as an original document in the natural history of mendacity the credulous regarded it as a wonder not surpassed by the gigantic glacier itself the discussion arose in the newspapers as to whether some distant city as montreal could have been brought into view by the freaks of the marvelous alaskan atmosphere many who thought this impossible leaned to the belief that in the heart of alaska or in british columbia there is some great settlement of civilized men as yet undiscovered by geographers to those who held this opinion neither the nearness of the houses to the observer nor the peculiarities of the vegetation leafless elm trees in midsummer nor the tiles on the chimneys offered any difficulties 
the obvious but commonplace explanation was that of the few only even now every summer some account of the marvel goes the rounds of the newspapers i am told that in eighteen ninety six a company of people encamped for some time on the glacier in hopes of seeing this great wonder of nature they did not see it unfortunately but others had better success and these lucky ones have recently substantiated their account by their affidavits an affidavit in juneau cost but a drink of whiskey the usual price along the northwest coast a fact of which one great nation of our day has not been slow to profit in the connection with an international tribunal of arbitration as the sale of photographs declines more persons will probably be granted a sight of the silent city and there will arise a new series of affidavits and newspaper stories it is hardly necessary to call the attention of the intelligent reader to the absurdities involved in mr willoughby's story and in the photograph which is its financial justification but there are many persons not without education and culture who believe without the least question any tale which is uncanny or which seems outside the ordinary run of things in vain does science protest that the natural order is the only order there is that all contradictions to it are either so in appearance only or else are deceptions or frauds an interest in human psychology led dr charles h gilbert then acting as naturalist on the albatross to investigate mr willoughby's methods of photography he learned from mr willoughby that the plates used were of the ordinary sort but the mirage required a very long exposure to set the picture mr willoughby had had no previous knowledge of photography and had never tried to reproduce anything except mirages the chemicals used in developing the negative he would not describe it was a secret process the exposed plates had to be soaked for three months in the secret compound before the picture would be fixed this soaking took place in the open daylight no dark room being required nor did mr willoughby seem aware of the ordinary function of the dark chamber in photography the original negative examined by dr gilbert was a very old stained and faded plate apparently a negative which had been discarded because underexposed professor william h hudson of stanford university who lived for a time in bristol england recognizes the picture as a view of that city from brandon hill above the town the picture must have been taken some twenty years ago because professor hudson distinctly remembers the scaffolding around the towers of bristol cathedral at that time while the building was being repaired the hotel and the church to the left of the cathedral are also recognized by him a more transparent fraud could hardly be devised but its very imbecility assures its success we may be certain that for many years to come the silent city will be the wonder and pride of alaska's bleak hills and tourists eager to pierce the veil will speculate on the probability of its being perhaps altogether within the recesses of another world thus it comes about as i have elsewhere said that there is no intellectual craze so absurd as not to have a following among educated men and women there is no scheme for the renovation of the social order so silly that educated men will not invest their money in it there is no medical fraud so shameless that educated men will not give it their certificate there is no nonsense so unscientific that men called educated will not accept it as science end of the silent city of the muir glacier by david stark jordan read by phil schempf the story of sinui by unknown translated by alan gardner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the hereditary prince and count governor of the domains of the sovereign and the lands of the setiu true acquaintance of the king beloved of him the henchman sinui he says i was a henchman who followed his lord 
a servant of the royal harem attending on the hereditary princess the highly praised royal consort of sesostris in the pyramid town of kenem isat the royal daughter of Amenemes, in the pyramid town of kenofru even nofru the revered in year thirty third month of inundation day seven the god attained his horizon the king of upper and lower egypt Sehetebra, he flew to heaven and was united with the sun's disc the flesh of the god was merged in him who made him then was the residence hushed hearts were filled with mourning the great portals were closed the courtiers crouched head on lap the people grieved now his majesty had dispatched an army to the land of the timhi and his eldest son was the captain thereof the good god sesostris even now he was returning having carried away captives of the tehenu and cattle of all kinds beyond number and the companions of the royal palace sent to the western border to acquaint the king's son with the matters that had come to pass at the court and the messengers met him on the road they reached him at time of night not a moment did he wait the falcon flew away with his henchmen not suffering it to be known to his army howbeit message had been sent to the royal children who were with him in this army and one of them had been summoned and lo i stood and heard his voice as he was speaking being a little distance aloof and my heart became distraught my arms spread apart trembling having fallen on all my limbs leaping i betook myself thence to seek me a hiding place and placed me between two brambles so as to sunder the road from its traveller i set out southward yet purposed not to approach the residence for i thought there would be strife and i had no mind to live after him i crossed the waters of mekoti hard by the sycamore and arrived in island of snowfru i tarried there in the open fields and was afoot early when it was day i met a man who rose up in my path he showed dismay of me and feared when the time of supper came i drew nigh to the town of gu i ferried over in a barge without a rudder by the help of a western breeze and passed on by the east of the quarry in the district mistress of the red mountain i gave a road to my feet northward and attained the wall of the prince which was made to repel the setiu and to crush the sandfarers i bowed me down in a thicket through fear lest the watcher on the wall for the day might see i went on at time of night and when it dawned i reached petney i halted at the island of kimware an attack of thirst overtook me i was parched my throat burned and i said this is the taste of death then i lifted my heart and gathered up my body i heard the sound of the lowing of cattle and espied men of the setiu a sheik among them who was aforetime in egypt recognized me and gave me water he boiled for me milk i went with him to his tribe and they entreated me kindly land gave me to land i set forth to byblos i pushed on to kedme i spent half a year there then inshi son of amu prince of upper retinue took me and said to me thou farest well with me for thou hearest the tongue of egypt this he said for that he had become aware of my qualities he had heard of my wisdom egyptian folk who were there with him had testified concerning me and he said to me wherefore art thou come hither hath aught befallen at the residence and i said to him shehetebra is departed to the horizon and none knoweth what has happened in this matter and i spoke again dissembling i came from the expedition to the land of the timhi and report was made to me and my understanding reeled my heart was no longer in my body it carried me away on the path of the wastes yet none had spoken evil of me none had spat in my face i had heard no reviling word my name had not been heard in the mouth of the herald i know not what brought me to this country it was like the dispensation of god then said he to me how shall yon land fare without him the beneficent god the fear of whom was throughout the lands like sakmet in a year of plague spake i to him and answered him of a truth his son has entered the palace and has taken the inheritance of his father 
A god is he without a peer. None other surpasses him. A master of prudence is he, excellent in counsel, efficacious in decrees. Goings and comings are at his command. It is he who subdued the foreign lands while his father was within his palace, and reported to him what was ordered him to do. Valiant is he, achieving with his strong arm, active and none is like to him, when he is seen charging down on Ro Pedita, or approaching the Malay. A curber of horns is he, a weakener of hands, his enemies cannot marshal their ranks. Vengeful is he, a smasher of foreheads, none can stand in his neighborhood. Long of stride is he, destroying the fugitive, there is no ending for any that turns his back to him. Stout of heart is he when he sees a multitude, he suffers not sloth to encompass his heart. Headlong is he when he falls upon the Easterners, his joy is to plunder the Ropichu. He seizes the buckler, he tramples under foot, he repeats not his blow in order to kill. None can turn his shaft or bend his bow. The Pechu flee before him as before the might of the great goddess. He fights without end, he spares not and there is no remnant. He is a master of grace, great in sweetness, he conquers through love. His city loves him more than itself, it rejoices over him more than over its god. Men and women pass by in exultation concerning him now that he is king. He conquered while yet in the egg. His face has been set toward kingship ever since he was born. He is one who multiplies those who were born with him. He is unique, God-given. The land that he rules rejoices. He is one who enlarges his borders. He will conquer the southern lands, but he heeds not the northern lands. He was made to smite the Setyu, and to crush the sandfarers. Send to him, let him know thy name. Utter no curse against his majesty. He fails not to do good to the land that is loyal to him. Said he to me, Of a truth Egypt is happy since it knows that he prospers. But thou, behold, thou art here. Thou shalt dwell with me, and I will entreat thee kindly. And he placed me even before his children, and mated me with his eldest daughter. He caused me to choose for myself of his country, of the best that belonged to him on his border to another country. It was a goodly land called Yaa. Figs were in it and grapes, and its wine was more abundant than its water. Plentiful was its honey, many were its olives, all manner of fruits were upon its trees. Wheat was in it, and spelt, and limitless cattle of all kinds. Great also was that which fell to my portion by reason of the love bestowed on me. He made me ruler of a tribe of the best of his country. Food was provided me for my daily fare, and wine for my daily portion, cooked meat and roast fowl, over and above the animals of the desert. For men hunted and laid before me in addition to the quarry of my dogs. And there were made for me many dainties, and milk prepared in every way. I spent many years, and my children grew up as mighty men, each one controlling his tribe. The messenger who fared north or south to the residence tarried with me, for I caused all men to tarry. I gave water to the thirsty, and set upon the road him who was strayed. I rescued him who was plundered. When the Setyu waxed insolent to oppose the chieftains of the deserts, I counseled their movements. For this prince of retinue caused me to pass many years as commander of his host. Every country against which I marched when I made my assault, it was driven from its pastures and wells. I spoiled its cattle. I made captive its inhabitants. I took away their food. I slew people in it, by my strong arm, by my bow, by my movements, and by my excellent counsels. I found favor in his heart, and he loved me. He marked my bravery and placed me even before his children when he had seen that my hands prevailed. There came a mighty man of retinue and flaunted me in my tent. He was a champion without a peer, and had subdued the whole of retinue. He vowed that he would fight with me. He planned to rob me. He plotted to spoil my cattle by the counsel of his tribesfolk. The prince communed with me, and I said, I know him not. Forsooth, I am no confederate of his nor one who strode about his encampment. Yet have I ever opened his door or overthrown his fence. 
Nay, it is envy, because he sees me doing thy behest. Assuredly I am like a wandering bull in the midst of a strange herd, and the steer of those cattle charges him, a longhorn attacks him. Is there a humble man who is beloved in the condition of a master? There is no petty that makes cause with a man of the delta. What can fasten the papyrus to the rock? Does a bull love combat, and shall then a stronger bull wish to sound the retreat through dread, lest that one might equal him? If his heart be toward fighting, let him speak his will. Does God ignore what is ordained for him, or knows he how the matter stands? At night time I strung my bow, and tried my arrows. I drew out my dagger, and polished my weapons. Day dawned, and retinue was already come. It had stirred up its tribes, and had assembled the countries of a half of it. It had planned this fight. Forth he came against me where I stood, and I posted myself near him. Every heart burned for me, women and men jabbered. Every heart was sore for me, saying, Is there another mighty man who can fight against him? Then his shield, his battle-axe, and his armful of javelins fell, when I had escaped from his weapons, and had caused his arrows to pass by me uselessly sped, while one approached the other. I shot him, my arrow sticking in his neck. He cried aloud and fell on his nose. I laid him low with his own battle-axe, and raised my shout of victory over his back. Every a-am ah shrieked. I gave thanks to Montu, but his serfs mourned for him. This prince, Inshi, son of Amma, took me to his embrace. Then I carried off his possessions and spoiled his cattle. What he had devised to do unto me, that did I unto him. I seized what was in his tent. I ransacked his encampment. I became great thereby. I grew large in my riches. I became abundant in my flocks. Thus God has done so as to show mercy to him who he had condemned, whom he had made wander to another land. For to-day is his heart satisfied. A fugitive fled in his season. Now the report of me is in the residence. A laggard lagged because of hunger. Now I give bread to my neighbor. A man left his country because of nakedness. But I am clad in white raiment and linen. A man sped for lack of one whom he should send. But I am a plenteous owner of slaves. Beautiful is my house. Wide my dwelling place. The remembrance of me is in the palace. O God, whosoever thou art that didst ordain this flight, show mercy and bring me to the residence. Peradventure thou wilt grant me to see the place where my heart dwelleth. What matter is greater than that my corpse should be buried in the land wherein I was born? Come to my aid. A happy event has befallen. I have caused God to be merciful. May he do the like again so as to ennoble the end of him who he had abased his heart grieving for him whom he had compelled to live abroad. If it so be that to-day he is merciful, may he hear the prayer of one afar off. May he restore him whom he had stricken to the place whence he took him. O oh, may the king of Egypt show mercy to me that I may live by his mercy. May I salute the lady of the land who is in his palace. May I hear the behests of her children. O oh, let my flesh grow young again, for old age has befallen. Feebleness has overtaken me. Mine eyes are heavy. My hands are weak. My legs refuse to follow. My heart is weary, and death approaches me, when they shall bear me to the city of eternity. Let me serve my sovereign lady. O oh, let her discourse to me of her children's beauty. May she spend an eternity over me. Now it was told the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Capercare, concerning the pass wherein I was, Thereupon his majesty sent to me with gifts of the royal bounty, and gladdened the heart of this his servant, as it had been the prince of any foreign country. And the royal children who were within his palace caused me to hear their behests. Copy of the decree which was brought to this humble servant concerning his return to Egypt. Horus, life of births, two goddesses, life of births, king of upper and lower Egypt, Capercare, son of Ra, Sesostris, living for ever and ever. A royal decree unto the henchman Sinui. 
Behold, this decree of the king is brought to thee to instruct thee as following. Thou hast transversed the foreign lands, and art gone forth from Kedme to Retinue. Land gave thee to land, self-counseled by thy own heart. What hadst thou done that aught should be done against thee? Thou hadst not blasphemed, that thy words should be reproved. Thou hadst not spoken in the council of the nobles, that thy utterances should be banned. This determination, it seized thine own heart. It was not in my heart against thee. This thy heaven, who is in the palace, is established and prospereth daily. She hath her part in the kingship of the land. Her children are at the court. Mayest thou long enjoy the goodly things that they shall give thee. Mayest thou live by their bounty. Come thou to Egypt, that thou mayest see the residence where thou didst grow, that thou mayest kiss the earth at the great portals, and have thy lot among the companions. For today already thou hast begun to be old, thy manhood is spent. Bethink thee of the day of burial, the passing into beatitude, how that the night shall be decoded to thee with ointments, with bandages from the hands of Tate, and a funeral possession shall be made for thee on the day of joining the earth, the mummy shell of gold with head of lazuli, and a heaven above thee, and thou placed upon the hearse, oxen dragging thee, musicians in front of thee, and there shall be performed the dance of the Mu'u at the door of thy tomb, and the offering list shall be invoked for thee, and slaughterings made beside thy stela, thy columns being sharp of white stone amid the tombs of the royal children. Thus shalt thou not die abroad. Aamu shall not escort thee. Thou shalt not be placed in a sheepskin when thy mound is made. Yea, all these things shall fall to the ground. Wherefore, think of thy corpse, and come. This decree reached me as I stood in the midst of my tribesfolk. It was read aloud to me, and I laid me on my belly, and touching the soil, I strode it on my hair. And I went about my encampment rejoicing, and saying, How should such things be done to a servant whom his heart led astray to barbarous lands? Fair in sooth is the graciousness which delivereth me from death, inasmuch as thy call will grant me to accomplish the ending of my body at home. Copy of the Acknowledgement of this Decree the servant of the harem, Sinui, says, Fair hail, discerned is this flight that thy servant made in his witlessness. Yea, even by thy ka, thou good God, Lord of the two lands, whom Ra loves, and Montu, Lord of Thebes, praises. Amun, Lord of Karnak, Saab, Ra, Horus, Hathor, Atum with his Aeneid, Sabdu, Neferbayu, Simseru. Horus of the East, the Lady of Imet who rests on thy head, the conclave upon the waters, men in the midst of the deserts, Wereret, Lady of Punt, Harure, and all the gods of Timuri, and of the islands of the sea. They give life and strength to thy nose, they endue thee with thy gifts, they give to thee eternal, illimitable, time without born. The fear of thee is brooded abroad in cornlands and desert hills, Thou hast subdued all the circuit of the sun. This thy servant's prayer to his lord to rescue him in the west, the lord of perception, who perceiveth lowly folk, he perceived it in his noble palace. Thy servant feared to speak it. Now it is like some grave circumstance to repeat it. Thou great God, peer of raw in giving discretion to one toiling for himself. This thy servant is in the hand of a good counsellor in his behalf. Verily I am placed beneath his guidance. For thy majesty is the victorious Horus, thy hands are strong against all lands. Let now thy majesty cause to be brought Maki from Kedme, Kintiosh from Kinkesh, Menus from the lands of the Finku. They are renowned princes who have grown up in love of thee, albeit unremembered. Retinue is thine, like to thy hounds. But as touching this thy servant's flight, I planned it not. It was not in my heart. I conceived it not. I know not what sundered me from my place. It was the manner of a dream, as when a delta man sees himself in Elephantine, a man of the marshes in Totseti. I had not feared, 
none had pursued after me. I had heard no reviling word. My name had not been heard in the mouth of the herald. Nay, but my body quivered, my feet began to scurry, my heart directed me, the God who ordained this flight drew me away. Yet am I not stiff-backed, inasmuch as suffering the fear of a man that knows his land? For Ra has set the fear of thee throughout the land, the dread of thee in every foreign country. Whether I be at home, or whether I be in this place, it is thou that canst obscure yon horizon. The sun riseth at thy pleasure, the water in the rivers is drunk at thy will, the air in heaven is breathed at thy word. Thy servant will hand over the viziership which thy servant hath held in this place. But let thy majesty do as pleaseth thee. Men live by the breath that thou givest. Ra, Horus, and Hathor love this thy august nose, which Montu, lord of Thebes, wills should live eternally. Envoys came to this servant, and I was suffered to spend a day in Ya'a, to hand over my possessions to my children, my eldest son taking charge of my tribe all my possessions being in his hand, my serfs and all my cattle, my fruit and every pleasant tree of mine. Then came this humble servant southward, and halted at paths of Horus. The commander who was there in charge of the frontier patrol sent a message to the residents to bear tidings. And his majesty sent a trusty head fowler of the palace, having with him ships laden with presents of the royal bounty for the set to you, that were come with me to conduct me to paths of Horus, and I named each several one of them by his name. Brewers needed and strained in my presence, and every serving man made busy with his task. Then I set out and sailed until I reached the town of Iktui. And when the land was lightened, and it was morning, there came men to summon me, ten coming and ten going to convey me to the palace. And I pressed my forehead to the ground between the sphinxes, the royal children standing in the gateway against my coming. The companions that had been ushered into the forecourt showed me the way to the hall of audience, and I found his majesty on a throne in a gateway of gold, and I stretched myself on my belly, and my wit forsook me in his presence, albeit this god greeted me joyously. Yea, I was like a man caught in the dusk. My soul fled, my flesh quaked, and my heart was not in my body that I should know life from death. Thereupon his majesty said to one of those companions, Raise him up, let him speak to me. And his majesty said, Lo, thou art come, thou hast trodden the deserts, thou hast traversed the wastes, Eld has prevailed against thee, thou hast reached old age. It is no small matter that thy corpse should be buried without escort of Petu. But do not thus, do not thus, staying ever speechless when thy name is pronounced. But verily I feared punishment, and answered him with the answer of one afraid. What speaketh my lord to me? Would I might answer it, and may not. Lo, it is the hand of God, yea, the dread that is in my body, like that which caused this fateful flight. Behold, I am in thy presence. Thine is life. May thy majesty do as pleases thee. The royal children were caused to be ushered in. Then his majesty said to the royal consort, Behold, Sanui, who is come as an Aam, an offspring of Setu folk. She gave a great cry, and the royal children shrieked out altogether. And they said to his majesty, It is not really he, O sovereign my lord. And his majesty said, Yea, it is really he. Then brought they their necklaces, their rattles, and their sistra, and presented them to his majesty. Thy hands be on the beauteous one, O enduring king, on the ornament of the Lady of Heaven. May Noob give life to thy nose. May the Lady of the Stars join herself to thee. Let the goddess of Upper Egypt fare north, and the goddess of Lower Egypt fare south, united and conjoined in the name of thy majesty. May the Uraeus be set upon thy brow. Thou hast delivered thy subjects out of evil. May Ra, lord of the land, show thee grace. Hail to thee, and also to our sovereign lady. The horn of thy bow is slacked, thine arrow loosened. Give breath to one that is stifled, and grant us our goodly girdan, in the person of this sheik, Sumeut, the Pedti born in Timuri. He fled through fear of thee, he left this land through dread of thee. But as for the face of him who sees thy majesty, it blenches not, 
as for the eye that regardeth thee, it fears not. Then said his majesty, Nay, but he shall not fear, he shall not dread, for he shall be a companion among the magistrates. He shall sit in the midst of the nobles. Get you gone to the chamber of adornment to wait upon him. So when I was gone forth from the hall of audience, the royal children giving me their hands, we went together to the great portals, and I was placed in the house of a royal son. There was noble equipment in it, a bathroom and painted devices of the horizon, costly things of the treasury were in it. Garments of royal stuff were in every chamber, unguent and the fine oil of the king and of the courtiers whom he loves, and every serving man made busy with his task. Years were caused to pass away from my flesh. I was shaved and my hair was combed. A burden was given over to the desert, and clothing to the sandfarers. And I was clad in soft linen and anointed with fine oil. By night I lay upon a bed. I gave up the sand to them that dwell therein, and oil of wood to him who smears himself with it. There was given to me the house of a provincial governor such as a companion may possess. Many artificers built it, and all its woodwork was new appointed. And meals were brought to me from the palace three times, yea, four times a day, over and above that which the royal children gave, without remiss. And there was constructed for me a tomb of stone in the midst of the tombs. The masons that hewed tombs were marked out its ground plan. The master draftsmen designed in it. The master sculptors carved in it and the master architects who are in the necropolis bestowed their care upon it, and all the gear that is placed in a tomb-shaft went to its equipment. And call-servants were given to me, and there was made for me a sepulchral garden, in which were fields in front of my abode, even as is done for a chief companion. And my statue was overlaid with gold, and its apron was of real gold. It was His Majesty caused it to be made. There is no poor man for whom the like hath been done, and I enjoyed the favours of the royal bounty until the day of death came. It is finished, from the beginning to the end, according as it was found in writing. End of the Story of Sinui By Unknown Author Translated by Alan Gardner Recorded by Philip Gould A Tight Squeeze for Uncle George by Thomas Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devorah Allen I came near going on the stage once. Not to act, you understand. Not as bad as that. But simply to show stage managers a few things about their business. In the fresh, springtime of my career, I never hesitated to butt, with a few pertinent suggestions, into any ancient art or science I ran across. And having, at the time of this tale, just made the acquaintance of the drama, as a means of livelihood, which had been plugging along quite a spell on scanty resources, I deigned to give even that lowly calling a little attention. The occasion was my Uncle George's taking me to the theatre for the first time. In those days, people approved of the theatre as heartily as they do of opium dens now, that is to say, scarcely at all, or less. But Unc had a theory that it was beneficial to make the devil's acquaintance young, so he insisted, as much as he had to, on my going along. We had to watch our step carefully, because a previous expedition of ours under his theory, I think it was a horse race, had caused unmistakable demur in the family. It made father almost impetuous. He said that while a pesky bachelor, Uncle George was such, might poison his own soul in any loathsome way he saw fit, it meant a hell sentence for him to lure innocent youth into the clutches of the evil one, and he went on to describe, for Unc's special benefit, the warmth of that particular hell reserved for middle-aged reprobates convicted of luring. This was before the invention of thermit and oxyacetylene, and the only fuel that theology possessed to get up steam for the sinners with was fire and brimstone. With the modern inflammables, father's imagination of hell would have made him such an extra hazard around the house as to vitiate our fire insurance policy. But he did pretty well with even the old-fashioned chemicals. He did so well, anyhow, that Uncle George, when he called to take me to the matinee, 
thought it prudent to employ camouflage, and carried conspicuously two smelt poles and a can of bait, which he left in a vacant lot after they had created the desired atmosphere of innocence. The theatre that agitated the old folks so meant plays like Uncle Tom's Cabin and Ten Nights in a Bar Room that dripped like a shirt in the ringer with morality and sadness. As even these dismal sketches were supposed irresistibly to skid the virtuous from the straight and narrow path, a stupefied horror overspread the community when, along in the eighties, came the first show that actually aimed to be merry. "'Good night,' said the community. "'So there was something worse, after all.' This new show was The Black Crook. Today we should call it Spectacle and Extravaganza, and let it go at that. But to the elders it was a moral catastrophe, without any special classification." They objected to it practically in toto, as the fellow says. They objected to the story of the play, or plot, because it was a downright lie, not even founded on fact, which at least you could say for Eliza's trip on the ice. And what did you think of the witches and fairies and men dressed up like animals? Didn't that give you false impressions of life? I should say so. Then look at the dancers, and card trick players, and actors that made believe intoxicated— all the forms of iniquity you ever heard of, and then some. But the most outrageous feature of all, the one mentioned with heavily bated breath, was the tights. Would you believe it? Women, or beings in female form, actually came on the stage, wearing nothing but, sort of, stockings, you know, on their, their, well, what they wear stockings on. It was only after the black crook had departed, it had quite a long run before all the sinners were accommodated, that my spiritual health was regarded as beyond danger. But alas, you get me? It happened to be that very show which Uncle George took me to see. It surely was a busy afternoon for little nephew, with his inventive mind. The celebrated ladies in stockings were all that fancy painted, and more, for they'd done some painting on their own account. These, being the work of so competent an inventor as the devil, were clearly beyond my powers of improvement. But the mechanical devices promptly met with my usual constructive criticism. Our being seated in the front row helped some. Uncle George said he had to sit there on account of being very near-sighted. Not having heard of his infirmity before, I felt sorry for him, and told him so, after which my conscience allowed me to reap the benefit of his misfortune. Several inventions occurred to me, so close together that they almost overlapped. I mentioned them to Uncle George, but the Amazons were marching, and he seemed preoccupied. Evidently the show as it stood was good enough for him. The chief of these inventions was inspired by a beautiful blue light, studded with stars, which invaded the stage at certain intense moments. Something told me it was produced by a glass plate shoved in front of the calcium light, the display being heralded by the magnified image of the chipped edge of the plate, followed by a flock of elephant tracks, due to prints of the operator's fingers, stained by honest toil. At the first sight of this spectacle, the invention referred to burst upon me with that sort of phoratic shock familiar to inventors, particularly young ones. By the time it came again, my apparatus was completed, mentally, to the last detail, by the third view, I was storming the theatrical profession with it, and making lucrative contracts right and left, and the royalties were just about to pour in when the show was over, and Uncle George was suggesting that we leave the Temple of Thespis by the back door on Mason Street, it being handier to the car, also less handy to the public eye. My invention consisted of allying to the projection business what highbrows call a sister art, and my acquaintance with this sister— a modest violet now to be dragged into the garish light that beats upon the stage, came about in the following way. The Riverside Press, in Cambridge, my native burg, was a favorite prowling ground for us kids. If you were good, and didn't bother any, you could stand and watch one of the big presses squeeze a sheet of paper, haul it out covered with book pages, and spank it down on top of a pile of previously printed ones, with an almost human emphasis that reminded you of the there thank goodness, air of a woman, ironing the last piece in the wash. Sometimes the printer would give you a sheet that had got spoiled by going in crooked, and you could read the middle eight pages of a detective story for nothing. 
though, of course, a detective story with both the crime and the detection extracted is very low in percentage of thrill. Besides the printing, there were a hundred other processes to see, and each was so interesting that you never got very far in a single visit to the press. Before you knew it, the whistle would blow, the machinery would slow down and stop, and the workman would thank you for your kind attention and depart to see if he could find a clean place on the roller towel. One day, as I was exploring this palace of marvels, I came upon a workman over in a corner by himself, without a single power machine, and with only a tank and a lot of bottles. He was marbling paper, and the barbaric richness of his product was enough to make you dream you dwelt in marble halls, as the song goes. On the surface of his tank of water, he sprinkled drops of brilliant colored oils, red, green, yellow, brown, the vividest tints in the tintery. Each drop, as it struck the water, floated and spread out in a perfect circle. Then, as he combed or swirled the surface with the simplest tools, the colored circles drew out, zigzagged, spiraled, scalloped, and finally came to rest in the intricate design of variegated marble. On this, a sheet of paper was gently let down, the oils adhered in an instant, and the design, as intangible as a bubble, was fixed forever. That was the invention which popped into my head at the theatre. To project on the stage these magnificent colored designs, shifting every instant like the figures in a kaleidoscope. The drawing speaks for itself. The invention's middle name was Simplicity. The tank for blending the colors was to be of glass. The beam from a stereo-opticon, condensed by lenses, was to cast upward an image of the colored film, which a mirror would then reflect into a horizontal direction to flood the stage. The stirring of the colors was to be done by a stream of air through a blowpipe, to keep the cause of the changes invisible. Fortune was mine, again. If the theatrical world would stand for that crude blue-and-star effect, unworthy of the inventive powers of a semi-intelligent janitor, what sort of transports would it throw at sight of my dizzying spectacle? Answer. Once seen, it would be universally demanded. With the monopoly of the business in my grasp, I felt that I must be firm with Keralfi, the spectacle king of those days. He would probably try to get, for almost nothing, my invention which was destined to lift his shows absolutely out of the commonplace. The experiment had to be tried out, of course, if only for gloating purposes. And fortunately, I had a small magic lantern as so much toward the equipment. I made a tank from a window pane surrounded by a wall of putty, and the lone workman at the press, out of regard for science, also, to some extent for his own peace of mind, contributed an assortment of his liveliest pigments. My lantern being lighted, and everything ready for the test, I scattered a few drops of the various oils on the water in my tank, blew gently across the surface through a straw, and was delighted to see the colored discs stretch out, mingle in bands like a Roman sash, or form gorgeous designs varied from moment to moment, all projected in a magnified form on the whitewashed cellar wall. So far, I had got by without exciting the family suspicions of my dealings with the powers of darkness, as the magic lantern was a familiar household object, and I was always messing around with something or other. I was about ready to run away to New York and confer my invention on the waiting public when the enterprise was wrecked. Yes, sir, absolutely wrecked, simply by extending the experiment to a wholly unnecessary realism. At that time, my particular pal and partner in undertakings of magnitude was Gimp Skillings, who lived next door. The Skillingses were easy-going people, and Gimp was little hampered by restrictions. In fact, he lived the wild, free life of a man of the world, so far as it could be done on an income expressed in marbles and rusty nails rather than money. Gimp, of course, knew all about the theatre, and while his approval of my invention was enough to guarantee it in the winning class, he strongly advised adding to our equipment a model stage. It seemed superfluous to me, but Gimp was keen for it, claiming that Mr. Keralfi always required a working model before signing a contract. In fact, it was the invariable custom in theatrical circles. That settled it. So we went to work and built a miniature stage out of a soapbox, painted with a proscenium arch and footlights, and hung with a series of cheesecloth curtains to reproduce the sensational finale of the Black Crook. 
a small doll of my sister's consented to assume the role of the fairy queen, standing with white robe, wings, and star-tipped wand behind the innermost curtain, to be revealed at the critical moment, rescue the lovers, and swat the crook into his flaming pit. The full-dress rehearsal came off at four o'clock one Saturday afternoon. It was a winter day, and cloudy at that, so it was practically pitch dark in the cellar, which of course was just what we wanted. Gimp worked the stage properties, while I handled the light. As I started the colors going, he raised the cheesecloth curtains one by one, declaiming the impressive climax of our favorite playlet, full of these and thous, with here and there a forsooth or two to give it tone. As the last curtain went up, exposing the doll in her fairy queen rig, Gimp turned on the full force of eloquence in the thrilling speech. Fear not, weak mortals, I will protect thee henceforth. And thou, O black crook, down, down with thee to the nethermost depths and the torments of the damned. Whereupon Gimp opened the furnace door and threw in a lump of coal to represent the crook. Now, damned was a word very much out of favor in those times. Its use was considered such extremely bad form that when Father met with it in reading the Bible aloud, he mumbled it apologetically, as though its presence even there had been due to a slip on someone's part. So when Gimp damned the crook, I glanced around involuntarily, as you will at a noise in a haunted house, even if you don't believe in ghosts. One glance, and my blood froze solid. Out of that part of the dense darkness which I knew was the cellar doorway, a face stood forth. Only a face, no body attached, illuminated by the red glare from the furnace. The face was father's. It looked as though our melodrama had got too good a start, and was about to unfold a new act on its own hook. Gimp and I shrank three sizes, and waited breathlessly. Breathless is often used to describe suspense, but it's generally an overstatement, not in this case. Father opened up his performance with a sight act. Advancing on our theatrical equipment, he seized Gimp's stage in one hand and my pet apparatus in the other, and stuffed them into the furnace, where the ex-crook, with the rest of the coal, was glowing balefully. Then he cleared his throat for the speaking part. With a crime of such unusual juiciness to handle, it was up to Father to make a record. He did. He pounded like Elijah on the prophets of Baal, but not on me, on Gimp. And even on Gimp he lit only in passing, to denounce his supposed offense of enticing me to sin. Through Gimp, he was seizing the opportunity for his first good, healthy crack at the Skillings family. It was bewildering to hear the vial of his wrath go bouncing down the field like a hot liner through the smarting hands of second base and shortstop. It was a three-bagger for the Skillingses, believe me. All the disapproval which he and mother had been nursing against their next-door neighbors since they first moved onto the street ten years before tried to get off father's chest in a single package. The whole tale of their domestic shortcomings, from their soiled attic windows to their undisciplined, playmate-contaminating child. Father was not usually a rapid speaker, but this time you could almost hear the brakes squeak as his high-powered sentences fought each other for a place in the line. For my part, I knew this wasn't letting me out. Enticement was no excuse in our family, and I was scheduled later to get mine, with all the then-modern embellishments. But there was almost cheerfulness in the thought that Uncle George was escaping the taint of a cruel, if merited, suspicion. Gimp, as the scapegoat, was being somewhat roughly handled, to be sure. But Gimp's injuries could be settled for, if I could only keep him quiet. The outraged Gimp, at every chance, was sputtering forth such preludes as, "'It wasn't—' "'Say, look here!' and most perilous of all, it was his unc— At every sputter I pinched him forcefully in the darkness, also in the leg, hissing, "'Cheese it! Let it go! I'll make it all right with you!' and other soothing sounds, till finally I got him under control. The climax of Father's speech came in a detailed list of the Skillings's failings. He tried to use words of one syllable, so Gimp could take it home with him, but he had to give that up. It was no job for verbal flivers." As it progressed, one learned that the family's denuded and broken-fenced yard excited not pity, but contempt, that their cornet-playing border was a nuisance which called for the attention of the grand jury, while as to their persistent and pestiferous practice of purloining their neighbor's property under the subterfuge of borrowing, it was enough. It was enough. 
Just then his foot stubbed on a gloom-hidden object which clanked softly at him, like a watchful friend in a threatened predicament, whispering, Spill! It was the Skillings' lawnmower, borrowed late in the season and forgotten. Father's discourse came to a sudden end. He wasn't taken aback, you understand. He only happened to be seized with a coughing spell he was subject to in moments of excitement. He fled upstairs for relief. Uncle George was saved, and Gimp applied himself to estimating his damages. That was as near as I got to the stage, for my great invention remained in abeyance, owing to unfavorable business conditions. The Black Crook and its successors, Superba, Babes in the Wood, and many other aids to moral indigestion, ran their course and died, their proprietors never suspecting that they'd actually missed the one real opportunity of their lives. End of A Tight Squeeze for Uncle George by Thomas Reed